inflation. As consumers deal with high inflation, we're continuing to help you save money while dining out to cutting costs at the grocery store. But first, we are all thinking about our next vacation. So how can you find the best spring travel deals? Spring is in the air, and after years of missing out, college students and families are making spring break a priority this season, with hotspots in Florida, the Southwest, and south of the border at the top of the list, according to travel booking site Hopper. If you're headed to a very popular warm weather spring break destination, you should be booking your flight now. Travel costs are not immune to inflation. Hotel rates are up 64 percent from last year, and flights cost 20 percent more. But there are spring break deals out there. Hopper advertising $82 round trip flights to Orlando from New York, Boston to San Diego for $190, and Newark round trip to Turks and Caicos for $260. But the clock is ticking. Families heading to vacation hotspots should book as soon as possible. Prices might rise by more than $200 a ticket in the weeks closer to spring break. Expect full flights and hotels and make contingency plans in case of flight cancellations. For budget-conscious travelers, be flexible. Midweek flights can be up to $100 cheaper per person. Wait to book big city hotels. Last-minute room deals can save you up to 25%. And consider a staycation. One of the best ways to get an incredible deal when you do a staycation is to reach out to local hotels or accommodation providers. Ask if they have a geofenced rate. Hotels often will offer a lower rate to residents of the town, the community, sometimes even the state, to incentivize locals to stay at their accommodations. Meanwhile, international travel has also roared back with Asian destinations like China, Japan and Indonesia reopening post-pandemic and attracting crowds of young people eager to experience a new part of the world and take advantage of the strong dollar. When you add up hotel, eating out, Ubers to and from airports, the total amount of money you're spending to go somewhere in the U.S. might actually be the same amount you would spend going somewhere in Asia or Europe. Savvy travelers should plan out a complete budget, including the cost of taxis, rental cars, food and drink, and excursions. Tips to maximize your spring break without breaking the bank. If you're thinking about hitting the open seas, cruise lines are offering some big savings right now. Roller coasters, go-kart racing, water parks, not on land, but at sea. And with several new ships arriving this year, cruises can be found at all price points, like this three-night cruise in the Bahamas for under 300 bucks per person, or a seven-night voyage for two on the Mediterranean for 2,900. As travel restrictions ease, families are ready to hit the high seas. Well, I think there was an appetite for people who really wanted to travel and really weren't doing it during the pandemic. Colleen McDaniel is the editor-in-chief of CruiseCritic.com. Why is cruising back in such a big way? Cruising is bringing new ships. They are loaded with amenities and things to do. Activities like go-kart racing or rock wall climbing, all these cool things that you can do ashore, you can now do on a cruise ship. Just how big is this wave of reservations? Celebrity Cruises had its largest booking day ever on Black Friday. Holland America up 20% from 2019. And Royal Caribbean had its biggest booking day in the company's 53-year history. Among the most popular destinations, Alaska and Northern Europe's British Isles, Greenland and Iceland. McDaniel says start by working with a travel agent, especially if you've never cruised before. And don't pick based on price. Tell the agent what you want to do. Pricing will be a part of it, but it shouldn't be the biggest factor because if you don't have that great ship, you're not going to have the perfect experience. If you're booking the cruise yourself, look for discounted gift cards on websites like Rays or CardCash.com. We found this one a $500 value for $430. If you apply several gift cards to your purchase, the savings really add up. <laughs> So how do you make the most of your experience and save money once you're on board the ship? Well, to show you, I'm here on The Gem by Norwegian Cruise Lines. And with me, Stephanie Cardell. She's the director of communications. So, Steph, what should folks think about once they set foot on board? Sure. There's so much to do on board. Everybody loves to dine and eat when they're on board the ship. So make sure you go down and you get your specialty dining package if you haven't done so yet. Same with your unlimited beverage package. You know, if you want to spend days around the pool um, having your favorite cocktail, make sure to do that first. And those packages tend to save you more money than if you bought a la carte. Absolutely. And then you have some tips on saving on the rooms too. 
Yep. Let's go check those out. Great. So Steph, what do you need to think about when it comes to accommodations if you're on a budget? It really depends what type of traveler you are, right? Or if you're traveling solo, we have studio staterooms, right? So they're designed and priced for the solo traveler. If you're looking to just spend um, more of your time outside, enjoying the pool deck, enjoying the bars, the entertainment, then an inside stateroom might be for you. Or if you're looking to spread out in more luxurious accommodations or if you have a large family, something like this, the three bedroom Haven Villa, might be a great option for you. And you can split the cost of your traveling with another couple or some other friends. Absolutely. It's like having your apartment out at sea. Thank you. My pleasure. The cost of drinks can really add up on a cruise, but check out cruiselead.com. They have a drink calculator that can help you figure out which drink package to save you the most money. However you vacation, grab some me time. The best time to save on the spa when the ship is docked. You have a secret tip for saving at the spa. What's that? So on port days, there's always a special. So keep an eye out. You'll get a notice in your room, and that'll tell you what that special is for the port. And the better deals are as the cruise is getting closer to its end. Up next, sharing a home share. From planning to safety, what to figure out before your next dream vacation so it doesn't turn into a nightmare. And later, what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. It's become an alternative to hotels and resorts renting a vacation home. And it could be a good way to save money. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to finding the perfect vacation home for your next trip. Need an escape from the daily grind? For your next family vacation, you could relax by the pool at this home in Port St. Lucie, Florida for $333 a night. Or watch the sunrise at this oceanfront condo in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for $507 a night. Or enjoy the view from the hot tub at this luxury chalet in Steamboat Springs, Colorado for $1325 a night. These rentals all big enough to share with another family. It's a popular travel trend as many look to give their wallets a break this spring. The average family of four now spends more than $4,500 on a vacation each year. But by buddying up at a home share, you can split the cost with others, saving you money while making priceless memories. Last year, Airbnb reporting family travel nearly doubled to 98% in the U.S. alone. And a recent Verbo survey finding this year, 57% of travelers plan to take trips more often with groups of friends. To rent a big, huge, you know, three floor house or cabin would have not made financial sense. So splitting it with a family was perfect. Karen Ensley, her husband Will, and their daughter Sienna escaped to the great outdoors with some friends in the Pocono Mountains. After discussing their budgets, the two families searched Airbnb to find a spacious cabin within their price range. We wanted to make sure we had enough space so that the two families could be together but separate. Ensley says they took in the sights and the savings, as the outdoor toys included with the rental provided entertainment. The families also split the grocery bill. It ends up being cheaper than a hotel. But when vacationing, the phrase, the more the merrier, doesn't always apply. 
Travel preparedness expert Cheryl Nelson says before booking a shared space, discussing the details can help ensure everyone goes and comes back as friends. What about if you're traveling with another family on a shared vacation? What are some tips to make it out of that <laughs> intact? There's got to be some house rules that you set. Are there quiet hours? Agree on that. What about pets? Don't bring your dog if somebody else is bringing their cat. And kids, how are the kids going to play? Talk about the budget, how much space you need, and if you want to split the cost per family or per person. Nelson even suggests assigning rooms ahead of time. A lot of the times there's only one, maybe two master suites in the house. You don't want everybody fighting over that when they get there. Other topics to consider, how to split food costs, how much time to spend together and apart, sleep habits, and as Ensley learned, who does the chores? If one family's cooking, maybe the other one cleans that day and, and you kind of switch back and forth. When considering a home rental, Nelson says make safety a priority. Only rent from verified hosts. Read all the reviews about that property. You can also check out the surrounding area by entering the address on a street view map. And one more tip, you can see the recent serious crimes there if you put the address into crimemapping.com. What are some red flags you should look for in a listing? If they don't provide any sort of picture of a doorway or external pictures, that might raise a red flag. Nelson shows us her first safety check. Does the rental have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide alarm? You can also bring your own. This one's portable. All you do is plug it into the wall. She then uses a flashlight to look for hidden cameras. Ideally, I'd close the blinds, lights would be off. And as I'm lounging, I would just start pointing this at vents. If you see anything reflecting back at you, there might be a hidden camera in there. And she checks drawers for sharp objects and drugs or chemicals. Tips to keep your home share travels full of good, clean family fun. Still to come, how to avoid paying extra airline fees and later, deal or no deal, how to find the best prices at your grocery store. We're back after this. Welcome back. Consumers are already battling inflation, and now it seems we're also seeing more of those so-called junk fees charged by airlines. NBC's Tom Costello spoke to our friends on the Today Show about a new policy that could make flying cheaper. It's a travel hassle familiar to any family traveling with kids. Either shell out the extra cash for seat selections up front or try to wing it at the gate. Now United Airlines is rolling out a new seating policy to make the skies a bit friendlier, allowing accompanying parents and adults to sit next to children younger than 12 without paying extra. 
That's a big deal for parents like Nathan Herrig and his family of four. It takes away one of the most stressful parts of flying, which is, you know, uh, what am I going to do with my kids on the flight? Along with the ticketing policy, United says it's also unveiling new technology that will open up more seats on its flights to help automatically keep younger children next to an adult in their party, giving access to regular economy seats and preferred seats if needed. No extra fee. It's not uncommon to see seat selection as much as 50, 60 or $70 per person. And so if you're talking about a family of four, that can run well over $200 just to reserve your specific seat. The new feature will be available to families purchasing either regular tickets or basic economy tickets, which typically have more restrictions. The move comes as regulators, lawmakers and the White House have taken sharp aim at so-called junk fees that airlines charge. We'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. The airline industry says carriers try to seat families together, often at the gate, but families sometimes buy seats together that cost more. Experts say United's new boarding tool should remove some of the boarding stress for families. It's going to be better for uh, airline gate agents who don't have to try to play musical chairs. All right, Tom, some good tips, but if families are booking with other airlines outside of United, how can they avoid that seating yeah. fee? Now, let's walk through a couple of tips for you. Uh, first of all, you should try to call the airline in advance. If you're going ahead and booking online, First of all, try to see if you can book together. That may be difficult, but give it a shot. Call the airline in advance. Explain to them you're traveling with young kids. And if that doesn't work or if they simply can't help you, the agent at the gate, hopefully, at the airport can help you as well. And here's a good tip. If you're traveling with kids, try to choose maybe a seat, all seats in the back of the plane. Those usually don't fill up as fast, and usually those are not premium seats. It's easier to get seats together. Closer to the bathroom, yeah, too, by the way. Yeah. In that case, with little kids, not a bad thing. How about baggage fees? Because those can really add up, too, Tom. Well, you know, if you have status, if you fly a lot, usually your status will allow you to check a bag for free. But those airline credit cards usually will give you at least one, sometimes two bags for free. So consider that using a credit card for the airline that you're on. Also, compare the policies. Not all airlines charge to check bags. Southwest still does not. So you might want to be looking and considering whether that's a factor. And then if you want to try to avoid that checking the bag fee, you might want to try to carry on and then check the bag at the gate. However, your bag can't be so big it doesn't fit through the TSA x-ray machine. It's not just airlines that are tacking on those fees, hotels, concerts, even banks too. So how can we avoid extra fees? NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently shared some ways to cut down on costs. All right, so we're going to take it one step at a time by the by the numbers. Let's start with those dreaded banking fees. What are we working with here? Yeah, well, it costs a lot to use plastic Chanel. And the number I've got for you here is $29.80. Okay. That number comes from bank rate. That's how much it costs to overdraft. You don't have enough money in your checking account. The bank has to move from your savings account, and that's going to cost you a lot of money. So that make sure up. you have enough in your checking account. Yeah, but look, yeah. there's a lot of other fees that are associated with using bank services as well. Okay. ATM fees, $4.66. Per what? Per transaction. That's also according to bank rate. So if you want to avoid that, try to stay inside your debit card network. Take a look at the back of the plastic to make okay. sure you know where to use it. And then there's okay. also credit card late fees, right? <laughs> On top of the interest that you're going to pay for anything that's overdue, you're also yep. going to get this late fee of about $30. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is actually proposing under the Biden administration to cap that at $8. Really? And, yep, and the CFPB, again, it's a proposal right now, okay. but they say that could save Americans about $9 billion. And by the way, <laughs> Chanel, for all these fees, if you do face it, try to give your bank a call. Just say, hey, look, I'm really sorry about that. Maybe can you waive it? I've done it before with the overdraft Right, especially fee. if it's just one time. Exactly. And yeah, the worst you, they could do, say no. Say no. Yep, okay, exactly. to save that money. All right, next, let's talk about, this is a good one, the extra cost yes. we pay for cable yep. and internet. <laughs> yeah, really expensive. And, and the number I've got for you right here is 11.3%. That's the estimated inflation that we've seen just since the beginning of the pandemic for your cable fees. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's on top of what Consumer Reports estimated was $450 in yearly cable fees that people are paying. So fees, and not just wow. the... Just well, the, that is actually the bill, but oh, it that's includes the bill. fees, which okay. I'm going to get to right here. Company imposed fees as 
as part of that are about 24% according to uh, mm -hmm. Consumer Reports. But I feel now, like it feel, you feel helpless. Like you get the bill and you have all those fees on there. What are you supposed to do? Well, you, you, I mean, you can call the cable company and try to yeah. see if you can negotiate some of those fees. But there are things like, for example, modem rentals. They'll okay. say you have to rent from us. That could be up to $15 a month. You could buy your own modem, your own router mm -hmm. from Best Buy, for example, and then yeah. save yourself the monthly fee. Okay. And also watch out for cancellation fees. If you try to get out of a contract early, could be up to $200. But again, try to give your cable company a call. And also maybe consider cutting the cord if it's going to save you money just by streaming instead of buying a cable. But those streaming, those streaming services have all been Start jacking up. Yeah, all yeah, exactly. So you got to do the math and try to see based off of what channels you want whether or not it ends up working out. All right. It's crazy. All right, so if you actually get off the couch yep. and leave the house, we all want to do experiences. There's concerts, there's games, but the fees attached to ticketing is yep. also up. Dylan, so the number I've got for you is 27 to 31%. That's the average ticket fee. This is where we feel a lot of the pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of T-Swift fans will know this as well, <laughs> right? Now, let's do the math, right? Average concert ticket, according to uh, Polestar, is $108.20. So with another fee on top of that, mm -hmm. that's going to be another $30 just right. to get into the stadium. Average NBA game, I'm a huge Brooklyn Nets fan. I know this for a fact. $94, but again, the fees are mm -hmm. added on top of that. It's very expensive just to get inside the Barclays Arena. And then the average discount theater tickets, this is according to Today Ticks Group. They're saying it's about $55. That's not just Broadway, that's nationally, mm -hmm. by the way. Again, you're going to face fees on top of that. But so, no, what can you do for that? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to go directly to the box office. In many cases, you can get around these third party ticket mm -hmm. resellers to get around the fee. And then also remember that you can actually try to join a fan club, for example. Okay. They might offer discounted oh, tickets. That's a good as idea. Well. What ticks yeah. me off is when you you go and you buy your movie ticket online and they charge you a convenience yes. fee? Yeah, convenience What's fee. What's up with what? that? What's so convenient yeah, about that right now? <laughs> you have fewer cashiers because I'm buying online. Stop it! <laughs> anyway, uh, travel fees. Yes, yes. So what's the number well, there? Well, look, I get worked up just as much about travel fees as well. 30 to $35, that is the average airfare fees just for trying to pick your seat, just mm -hmm. to try to check your bags. Right. Things you can get around, try to check the bag maybe directly at the gate. I've got other numbers for you as well. Airport car rentals, another 23% more expensive to rent at the airport. Yeah. Oh, wow. Consider taking an Uber into a downtown location. Uh -huh. Renting from the same place mm -hmm. could be a lot cheaper. Resort fees, $40 just Can for Can you that. negotiate those? Eh, it's kind of tough, but the Biden administration is looking at perhaps nixing these fees and then airbnbs this is where it gets i mean everyone's experiencing this 14.2 percent could be the fees on top of what you're quoted wow. yeah. check the card try to check out so you get a final invoice and how much that's going to cost Ryan you Chung, great good advice Thanks so much yep. coming up how to stretch your dollars at the grocery store plus what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants With more Americans turning to discount stores to cope with high food prices, many traditional grocery stores are trying to lure back customers by pushing their own store brands and expanding loyalty programs. Here's how you can find the best deals. In aisles all across America, grocery shoppers are doing a double take. That's not even a cart full of groceries. As inflation sent food prices soaring, now more than half of all Americans, a whopping 60%, prefer non-traditional stores. Wholesale clubs like Costco or super centers such as Target and Walmart are often the go-to destination for food shoppers. 
That's causing a shuffle on the shelves. Some retailers to stay competitive for consumers are going to put items that are staple items on sale. They're also upping rewards on loyalty programs. As the grocery wars heat up, traditional chains like Kroger are leaning into their ability to provide fresh produce and relying on reputation to establish their own brand loyalty. What we find is uh, customers going from national brand to our brands and a customer is able to save 7 to 10 percent on a basket of goods when they buy our brands. They're also leaning into digital coupons, a big hit with shoppers. For us, our business model is designed to be successful regardless of the environment. The changing landscape can mean good news at the checkout. Stores like Aldi, which continue to expand, entice customers with cheap prices on popular brands. I think the prices are really good and they have a lot of good options. And I really like the frozen food section. I save about $100 at least a month. Discount stores are making a deep dent, too. I spent $35 on a week's worth of groceries at Dollar Tree. With one in five people shopping for groceries at Dollar Chains. They want you to see that they have the exact same quality of a name brand for much less. And often you'll see a comparison between the two prices, two big stickers right next to each other. Retailers like Dollar Tree are even remodeling some stores to showcase groceries and kitchen staples and partnering with delivery app Instacart to reach new customers. With so many choices, if you want to keep your grocery budget in check, experts suggest jump on those buy one, get one offers for your essential goods and freeze what you don't use. Set up a meal plan for the week to limit overspending. And don't forget to take advantage of those loyalty programs that can cut costs in line. Take a beat before you go to the grocery store and really do the research. You will be so surprised how much money you can save. Now to a closer look at big changes happening in the food industry. Some restaurants are offering deals like subscription services and extra perks to keep customers coming back. NBC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest. From chicken to beef to eggs, the price you pay for food at the grocery store remains high. And restaurants, big and small, are feeling that same sting from inflation. Food is getting outrageous. Many businesses have been forced to pass on those costs to consumers, making the price you pay for dine-in and takeout meals more expensive. 8% more than you paid for the same meals last year. That ballooning bill, the main reason over 60% of Americans say they're choosing to eat out less often. I feel like I'm paying more money for either not very much food or not very good food. Now restaurants are trying to turn down the heat on inflation while still cooking up deals for their customers. Some restaurants are even offering subscription plans. At Asian food chain P.F. Chang's, patrons can now pay $6.99 a month for exclusive loyalty perks, including double reward points, jumping to the front of the waitlist for a table, and free delivery. Industry insiders say that new revenue stream will help relieve some of the inflation stress on businesses. Have you all had to adjust your prices to reflect inflation costs? There's no secret that prices had to be adjusted, not only at our restaurant, but really everywhere, right? At this location in Los Angeles, employees say they're firing up more meals for P.F. Chang subscribers every day. Do you feel that people are really saving money by paying a subscription fee? I believe so. If you're a loyal customer and this is the place that you go to all the time, it's definitely worth it. At Panera Bread, a $120 annual subscription will get you into its unlimited sip club, where drinks and deliveries are available without any additional fees. Some smaller chains and local restaurants are thinking outside the box, offering inflation-conscious menus with options that are cheaper than a full-price plate. And restaurant operators are becoming pretty innovative in terms of how they operate in this extremely high-cost environment. If you're looking to dine out without breaking the bank, look for daily specials, which often offer a side and a drink for less. Opt for a late lunch instead of a more expensive dinner portion. And if you plan to carry out, see if you can order directly online or through the restaurant's app to help avoid extra delivery fees. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn.
hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on, it's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. 
two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time they were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago, and that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily, and I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid-20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together 
sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> my family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe, okay? And the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we, we treat these like eggs and oh. we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was going to look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, OK, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. 
I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers, and our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. Once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. I, honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, prove it. It's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. This is the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody <laughs> loved it. Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best one. No, everything I do is very 
how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> no, it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank you. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them. And then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you, 
love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely going to support it. It's going to become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmer's markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating. And it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dipped treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival, the turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of, you know, either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, 
love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Boost. So happy to be filling in for Hoda today. And over the next half hour, we hope to boost your day with a few stories that will leave you feeling inspired. Today, we're all about family, with stories showing the beauty of a mother's love, how a legacy can be passed down over generations, and the strength of sisterhood. First up, as part of our series, Through Mom's Eyes, Chanel Jones sat down with the mom behind singer and actress Dove Cameron for an all-new extended interview you'll only see here on The Boost. People who haven't had kids yet, they think that the real work is up front and then it gets easier as they get older. And I haven't found that to be the case because as they get older, their lives become more complex. You have to just be there with every single thing you've got. Words Bonnie has lived by, raising two daughters, 34-year-old Claire and 27-year-old Chloe, also known as superstar Dove Cameron. They're both super different. Claire was such an easy kid. And then Dove comes along and she feels everything very deeply. If she's happy, she's incredibly happy. If she's sad, she's incredibly sad. It took a whole different set of parenting skills. So how would you describe your parenting style? I'm not strict. <laughs> I should have been probably a little stricter. I'm more of a sort of be supportive, create the space for them to make their own mistakes with a safety net around them. A safety net put to the test as Dove grew up. She's an incredibly bright kid but school was not great for her. Hmm. There was quite a lot of bullying. What do you tell a seventh grader, a middle schooler, when they're being bullied? You just say, look, baby, they must be really sad and unhappy people if they're doing this. You just have to have compassion for them and understand that it is not about you. It's definitely about them. Her escape from school was performing. Did you remember a moment where you thought, you know what, this girl has a gift? I would say by the time she was eight. Really? And by the time she was 12, 13, her mentors were starting to pull me aside and say, you should think about going to LA. So they did. We didn't really know what we were doing. We threw everything we owned into a truck. Then it was like, whoa, how do we get an agent? It took a full year for Dove to book her first job. The very first thing she got was a two episode arc on Shameless. Hi, Holly. And then it was eight more months before she got her second thing. It's not like you get your first thing and you're like, okay, we're set now, it's all yeah. happening. You're pounding the pavement, she's going to the auditions. How do you keep going with that? We had this kind of loose agreement. If by the time you're 18, say, you don't have any real traction, we're gonna rethink this and you're gonna enroll yourself in some sort of additional education. That conversation became irrelevant with Disney's Liv and Maddie. <laughs> followed by the global franchise, Descendants. Hi, Mom. So when Descendants went nuts, like full disclosure, my daughter dressed as your daughter's character See, that gives me chills. That is a wild, amazing thing that so many young girls wanted to basically be this character yes. that she created. Yes. I mean, there's no words for that. And Dove hasn't stopped with an extensive list of acting credits, a budding music career, and nearly 50 million Instagram followers. What's the most challenging part of being a mom to someone who has this amount of success? Only being able to do so much to help her. There's mm. some, some stuff that only they can do, and that's hard. What's been the biggest pinch me moment? Watching her win the Emmy, do Light in the Piazza, win the Best New Artist at the AMAs this year. Those are kind of like the predictable moments. It's more like sitting backstage and watching her get ready to go do something. And I'm just like, this is really happening, isn't it? With her daughters all grown up, Bonnie has a new venture filling her time. We Can Books. We've developed an app that allows you to combine photos from your phone with our proven phonics word program and create these beautiful books that give kids a real head start in learning how to read. So when they're reading the book, they're looking at themselves. Yeah. Where did this venture come from? So when Claire was four and ready to learn how to read, right? My dad thought, I want to do something special to help her. So he rated our family photo albums and built 
the original prototypes for these books, literally with like cutting and pasting and three ring binders, and my kids learned how to read on them. So now we're able to create this app so that anybody can do it from their phones and get these beautiful it's really books. Cute. It's probably my life's work next to my kids. But Bonnie will always be mom first. Do you miss it? You know, as much as it was crazy, the two of you and you were in LA, you know, do you miss it? There were some beautiful intimate times where it was just the two of us, you know, having crazy adventures. And I've got memories of those times that are really, really special, you know. Look, you got me tearing up. Because I get it. Um, those times, they don't go on forever. <laughs> they can't, you know, inevitably. But I have to say, I'm so lucky. I'm still on speed dial. I'm still the first one they call when something is exciting or when something is terrible, you know? I'm the one they call. That's what you want, right? You can catch Dove in season two of Schmigadoon, premiering April 5th on Apple TV+. From one mom's support behind the scenes to another showing support on camera as the face of her son's fashion brand. Morgan Radford now with the story of how this business became a true family affair. Ready for the set. I never had a vision or a dream to ever have my own business. At just 23 years old, Travis Terry is making a name for himself in the fashion world with his brand, IMB. Have you ever had any inclination towards fashion historically when you were so, a kid? I think I'm a little fly guy. A little fly guy. Little fly guy. <laughs> it's a dream that started less than three years ago in his dorm room at Clark Atlanta University. While getting ready for a spring break trip, he realized he didn't have a bag for his clothes, but he did have a refund check from his student loans and an idea. I'm not wasting my money, I'm starting my own business and I'm trying to create bags. From there, IMB was born. I got the name from the word in my bag and I took the first letters of each word and the meaning is get to the bag, which means get money. <laughs> Still in college, Travis worked at a local deli in his hometown of Hartford, Connecticut to fund his dream. The business finally gained traction once he started designing and manufacturing his own bags. This is a form one bag, so you'd be able to take the bag off. Clutch comes off. Wow. Oh, she's cute. <laughs> Cheering him through it all, Travis's biggest supporter, his mom, Laverne. The neighborhood we came from, the kids that he grew around, a lot of them don't make it out. When you say a lot of kids don't make it out, what happens to them? Drugs, death, there's a lot of shooting with the young generation now. But Travis was different. He was determined to make it work. So when his usual model, his sister, couldn't make it to a photo shoot, <laughs> Travis turned to his mom. Together, their photo shoot, inspired by Cardi B, went viral. That shoot was the Grinch shoot, and ever since then, it was a wrap. It's what put you on the map. Put me on the map. It got a recognition from Cardi B. Now, Laverne is the face of her son's brand. Did you have modeling experience no, before this? No. Even making it onto a billboard in New York City's Times Square. I'm 61 now. I've never been as happy in my life. So this is like a new start of whatever God had for me. Was there ever any doubt about your age? No, because age is nothing but a number. <laughs> I'm still 23, 32, 45. And 61 and fabulous. Yes. <laughs> for Travis, bringing his mom on board was a way to show his love. I feel like I want to change the narrative of honoring your parents. She doesn't look like what she's been through, and that's the best thing of it all. She holds herself high and such a beautiful woman. How do you feel hearing that? Oh, <laughs> right. It's, you know. I'm trying not to cry. With Travis's right-hand woman by his side and in front of the camera, IMB products caught the attention of his local museum and was even spotted on some celebrities. It's a pinching yeah. moment, but it's kind of like, I need somebody else to pinch me, right? <laughs> What is your definition of success? When Beyonce get the bag, when I see it, I'm like, not even believe she got it. So Beyonce is the standard. Well, I don't know because, you know, I love Beyonce too, but it's all the way up to the top. To the top. <laughs> to the top. Coming up, we're keeping it in the family with stories spanning across generations. After the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. Judy Garland is a Hollywood icon with legendary roles in films, including The Wizard of Oz and A Star is Born. And her legacy lives on through her family. Dylan sat down with Garland's granddaughter, who shared a very special glimpse of the star through her eyes. I'm in awe, even being her own granddaughter. I'm so impressed and blown away that this four foot 11 little woman has this humongous voice. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Being Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz is her most legendary role, but for Judy Garland, being a grandmother may have been the role she most desired. Her excitement was seen on the Today Show back in 1967 as she sat with her two children, Lorna and Joe. Looking forward to being a grandmother? That's going to happen one of these can't days. Can't wait. Really? I can't wait. I'll let, I want her to have a baby immediately, and then she can see the baby for only 25 minutes, and I'll be a babysitter. Makes me tear up a little just hearing that because obviously we didn't get to see her. In Vanessa O'Neill's home, Judy is known as Triple G as she would now be a great grandma to Vanessa's two young sons. You're a great singer. To the world, Judy is an icon of Hollywood's golden era, starring in more than 31 films like A Star is Born, Easter Parade with Fred Astaire. Right, left, right, good. And Meet Me in St. Louis. She was also a Broadway legend and an acclaimed recording artist who was the first woman to win a Grammy for Album of the Year. It's really incredible how she paved the way for so many other women down the line. I always say that I have such strong women in my family who aren't afraid to speak up and be their most authentic self. And I know that that sometimes isn't probably easy, but I hope to pass that along to my kids. For Vanessa's family, Judy's ruby slippers are some big shoes to fill. When did it register with you that your grandmother was somebody truly special? I must have been about five or six, and my mom was performing in Vegas, and I saw, you know, like, my grandma on top of the slot machines, like, turning, <laughs> like a huge <laughs> bottle of her. Vanessa credits her mother, actress and singer Lorna Luck, with keeping her grandmother's memory alive. I watched my mom perform so much of my grandmother's music, you know, live and sitting in the wings. Lorna. Lorna wrote about life with Judy in her memoir, Me and My Shadows, 1998, saying of Judy, everything I know about being a good mother to my children, I learned from her. What traits would you say have, have been passed down through the generations to you? I definitely think our sense of humor. <laughs> it's, it's a huge, huge part of our personality to make things fun and funny, but also to get through hard times. I like to laugh. I like to have a bag of popcorn, go on a roller coaster now and then. But behind the lights and stage, Judy was often troubled and struggled with addiction. Did your mom ever talk with you about the bad sides or the downsides that fortunately your grandmother went through? Not until I got a little bit like of age. I do have the addiction gene myself. I'm seven years sober. And I really do feel like it's a genetic trait in my family. Vanessa's grandmother suffered with her own condition in silence. Judy Garland died of a drug overdose in 1969 at the young age of 47. My grandma was living in a time where there really wasn't much help. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't AA and these programs and people didn't really know what, what addiction was. Vanessa bypassed show business altogether and today is a personal trainer and nutrition coach. The health and wellness industry has helped me so much, not only with my physical health and body image, but my mental health, 1,000%. Her home is in Southern California with her husband, Patrick, their five-year-old son, Logan, and a brand new baby boy, Kieran, who was just born somewhere under the rainbow. A sign Vanessa says that Judy was there. You could see behind the little bassinet that my son was in, Sure enough, just a big rainbow right there. And it really makes you feel like, hey, like you are sending me a sign. Thank you. From one grandmother's impact to another, Katherine Johnson broke through barriers in the segregated South, working as a human computer for NASA. Her contribution to the space race famously portrayed in the film Hidden Figures. And now her great granddaughter is looking to make a mark of her own. Nakia Boykin's face lights up when she talks about her favorite subject at school. How long have you loved math? 
for as long as I can remember. I've always excelled in it. Honestly, the more complex the problem, the bigger rush I get when I get it right. This is every parent's dream. I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting across from you. I've never heard anybody talk about math and get so excited. You could say her love of math is genetic. Her great-grandmother is the late Katherine Johnson, the now famous NASA human computer whose problem-solving skills helped launch the U.S. into space. We're programming it wrong. Her story famously portrayed in the film Hidden Figures. Mom, that puts your landing zone at 5.0667 degrees north, 77.3333 degrees west. After the movie came out, and that's when I was like, wow, my grandma really did all this stuff. Honestly, I was in awe on how smart she was. To Boykin, Johnson was just a beloved great-grandmother who enjoyed crosswords and could play a mean game of rummy cube. She's always competitive with us, and I was too. It was just fun whenever I came down there. That fierce competitiveness made Johnson well-suited for the space race. She pushed herself forward at NASA's Langley Research Center. And by doing so, Catherine blew through barriers as a black woman in then segregated Virginia. Joylette Heilick is Johnson's daughter. It doesn't sound like in the moment she saw herself as a trailblazer by any means in that moment, did no. she? No, she said, I was just doing my job and I did it well. Johnson helped design the tracking system that predicted where John Glenn would land after he orbited the Earth. The astronaut famously asking her to back check the math before he launched. Let's get the girl to check the numbers. I don't believe he knew her by name. I believe he knew her reputation mm -hmm. because she said, I always did my best. Do your best, a motto her great-granddaughter took to heart when she was in just third grade. As I understand it, you guys were taking a standardized test and you were looking at that math portion and I heard you wanted to, to ace it. Is that true? I wanted to do my very best like she always would tell me. She did more than just ace the math test. Nakia got a perfect score. I like that. Guess what I got on my own um, math as well. I was like, I got 600, and we were just jumping up and down and laughing and everything. She couldn't wait to tell her great grandmother the news. She must have been so proud. She was just, she was proud of me. I could tell she was happy. At a school assembly, Nakia was sure to give credit where credit was due. I would really like to give my great grandmother, Catherine Johnson, a special thanks for inspiring me and a whole generation of young people to achieve our dreams. What does it feel like to see that gene or that love of math now uh, carry down to her great granddaughter? You know, the thing is, we were no, none of us, me, my kids, their kids, never heard math was hard. So that is one of the big things, I think, because we just did not get a negative attitude about science or math. Boykin is now in seventh grade and is more positive about math than ever. I'm in Algebra 1 and we're... Wait, time out. You are in seventh grade and you're doing Algebra 1? Yeah. I think I started that in high school. <laughs> As for a career? I don't know if I'm going to work at NASA or anything like she did, but math definitely will always be with me as I get older. Nakia's future wide open, in part because of the path her great-grandmother charted. Do you have any hopes for her in the future? Oh, of course. The sky is the limit. The moon is the limit. Coming up, how one mom started a movement and created a sisterhood of support after the break.
Welcome back. We are strolling into our next story, introducing you to a sisterhood of new moms who are part of a growing movement that all began with a walk. Jamie O'Neill says she didn't reinvent the wheel on activities for new moms. But every week she leads a stroller spectacle that literally stops traffic. It's so funny to watch people when we're walking across the street and it's mom after mom after mom and they're wondering what's going on. Moms and babies taking over the sidewalks all at once on the streets of Newport Beach, California. I like am holding back tears of the power of connection and love. When you walk out and I see, oh my gosh, there are 70 moms out here. This is unreal. It all started last spring after the birth of her son, Lincoln. The hormones were crazy. Uh, I wasn't working, so I was just home. My husband never stopped working. And so that's when I started to realize, wow, I feel lonely. I feel isolated. I have no idea what I'm doing because all I did was preparing for the day of birth. Beyond loneliness, Jamie still felt vulnerable after recovering from a 2019 car accident that left her with physical, mental, and emotional trauma. I knew going into pregnancy and postpartum that I would have to create different strategies and game plans to make sure that I didn't let the illness overcome me, but I can take on my mental health with strength and power. So come be my friend. She That's took a chance and reached out for some extra some support on TikTok. I threw a video out onto the internet saying any local moms that want to get a coffee and go for a walk, meet me here and I'd love to see you. And I had two strangers show up and we ended that walk saying, wow, this was so life-giving. I feel like a completely different human. I feel related to, I feel loved on. Jamie's video went viral and within weeks, the crowds grew and grew. And the common theme that we really heard is moms really just want to feel connected. And soon, the Mom Walk Collective was born. Social media brings us together, but it really makes a difference when you can actually bring people together in person. The group meets at a local coffee shop. Thank you so much for coming. And walks together for a mile loop with a stop for a rest, some play, and a chat. They don't ask if, you know, things are hectic and crazy. They're really just saying, hey, how are you doing? How's life going? Can I help you? Do you need a babysitter? If you need to run to the grocery, drop them off at my house. Unlike baby classes or groups, Jamie wants to keep the collective as support just for moms, free of charge. You don't have to sign up for a 10-week course. They can come as they are, whether they show up five minutes late, 10 minutes, 30 minutes late. Maybe they haven't slept. <laughs> they might have spit up on them. They're gonna be accepted and that they're actually gonna get showered with love and the resources they need. Within months, other moms became ambassadors for walks in other towns and cities. So we have about close to 80 cities running now, and we're hoping to pass 100 by the end of the year. We're also located in Canada, Australia. And what started with a cup of coffee is now a sisterhood of traveling strollers. It blows my mind every single time saying, this really must be a need and I'm just so happy that I get to be a vessel to create an opportunity. When we come back, we've got the latest viral video that'll put a smile on your face. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Boost. We've got one more video that is sure to make you smile. A teacher made a simple but highly consequential wager with his class. He picked one student to solve a math problem, and if she got the answer right, everyone got the reward. Let's see, here's how it played out. If Harley gets this right, then we can have free time. If she don't, then we still working. Harley, what answer did you write down? <laughs> oh boy, Harley, you did it. It's free time for everyone. That is pure joy right there. Even one kid crying here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at them hugging Harley. They're like, you did it. Wow. She went up last, had her back. I'm glad the teacher knew that she had the right answer. I think you're right. I, yeah. think, I don't think he'd set her up for that. Right. Yeah. that I think been. he saw she has it. I'm going to make this good. That is all for today. We'll be back with you tomorrow with more of our favorite feel-good stories. See you next time right here on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours. Join Hoda Kotb for season three of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. As consumers deal with high inflation, we're continuing to help you save money while dining out to cutting costs at the grocery store. But first, we are all thinking about our next vacation. So how can you find the best spring travel deals? Spring is in the air, and after years of missing out, college students and families are making spring break a priority this season with hotspots in Florida, the Southwest, and south of the border at the top of the list, according to travel booking site Hopper. If you're headed to a very popular warm weather spring break destination, you should be booking your flight now. Travel costs are not immune to inflation. Hotel rates are up 64% from last year, and flights cost 20% more. But there are spring break deals out there. Hopper advertising $82 round-trip flights to Orlando from New York, Boston to San Diego for $190, and Newark round trip to Turks and Caicos for $260. But the clock is ticking. Families heading to vacation hotspots should book as soon as possible. Prices might rise by more than $200 a ticket in the weeks closer to spring break. Expect full flights and hotels and make contingency plans in case of flight cancellations. For budget-conscious travelers, be flexible. Midweek flights can be up to $100 cheaper per person. Wait to book big city hotels. Last minute room deals can save you up to 25% and consider a staycation. One of the best ways to get an incredible deal when you do a staycation is to reach out to local hotels or accommodation providers. Ask if they have a geofenced rate. Hotels often will offer a lower rate to residents of the town, the community, sometimes even the state, to incentivize locals to stay at their accommodations. Meanwhile, international travel has also roared back with Asian destinations like China, Japan and Indonesia reopening post pandemic and attracting crowds of young people eager to experience a new part of the world and take advantage of the strong dollar. When you add up hotel, eating out, Ubers to and from airports, 
the total amount of money you're spending to go somewhere in the U.S. might actually be the same amount you would spend going somewhere in Asia or Europe. Savvy travelers should plan out a complete budget, including the cost of taxis, rental cars, food and drink, and excursions. Tips to maximize your spring break without breaking the bank. If you're thinking about hitting the open seas, cruise lines are offering some big savings right now. Roller coasters, go-kart racing, water parks, not on land, but at sea. And with several new ships arriving this year, cruises can be found at all price points, like this three-night cruise in the Bahamas for under 300 bucks per person, or a seven-night voyage for two on the Mediterranean for 2,900. As travel restrictions ease, families are ready to hit the high seas. Well, I think there was an appetite for people who really wanted to travel and really weren't doing it during the pandemic. Colleen McDaniel is the editor-in-chief of CruiseCritic.com. Why is cruising back in such a big way? Cruising is bringing new ships. They are loaded with amenities and things to do. Activities like go-kart racing or rock wall climbing, all these cool things that you can do ashore, you can now do on a cruise ship. Just how big is this wave of reservations? Celebrity Cruises had its largest booking day ever on Black Friday. Holland America up 20% from 2019. And Royal Caribbean had its biggest booking day in the company's 53-year history. Among the most popular destinations, Alaska and Northern Europe's British Isles, Greenland and Iceland. McDaniel says start by working with a travel agent, especially if you've never cruised before. And don't pick based on price. Tell the agent what you want to do. Pricing will be a part of it, but it shouldn't be the biggest factor because if you don't have that great ship, you're not going to have the perfect experience. If you're booking the cruise yourself, look for discounted gift cards on websites like Rays or CardCash.com. We found this one a $500 value for $430. If you apply several gift cards to your purchase, the savings really add up. <laughs> So how do you make the most of your experience and save money once you're on board the ship? Well, to show you, I'm here on The Gem by Norwegian Cruise Lines. And with me, Stephanie Cardell. She's the director of communications. So, Steph, what should folks think about once they set foot on board? Sure. There's so much to do on board. Everybody loves to dine and eat when they're on board the ship. So make sure you go down and you get your specialty dining package if you haven't done so yet. Same with your unlimited beverage package. You know, if you want to spend days around the pool um, having your favorite cocktail, make sure to do that first. And those packages tend to save you more money than if you bought la la carte. Absolutely. And then you have some tips on saving on the rooms too. Yep. Let's go check those out. Great. So Steph, what do you need to think about when it comes to accommodations if you're on a budget? It really depends what type of traveler you are, right? Or if you're traveling solo, we have studio staterooms, right? So they're designed and priced for the solo traveler. If you're looking to just spend um, more of your time outside, enjoying the pool deck, enjoying the bars, the entertainment, then an inside stateroom might be for you. Or if you're looking to spread out in more luxurious accommodations or if you have a large family, something like this, the three bedroom Haven Villa, might be a great option for you. And you can split the cost of your traveling with another couple or some other friends. Absolutely. It's like having your apartment out at sea. Thank you. My pleasure. The cost of drinks can really add up on a cruise, but check out cruiselead.com. They have a drink calculator that can help you figure out which drink package to save you the most money. However you vacation, grab some me time. The best time to save on the spa when the ship is docked. You have a secret tip for saving at the spa. What's that? So on port days, there's always a special. So keep an eye out. You'll get a notice in your room, and it'll tell you what that special is for the port. And the better deals are as the cruise is getting closer to its end. Up next, sharing a home share. From planning to safety, what to figure out before your next dream vacation so it doesn't turn into a nightmare. And later, what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. It's become an alternative to hotels and resorts renting a vacation home. And it could be a good way to save money. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to finding the perfect vacation home for your next trip. Need an escape from the daily grind? For your next family vacation, you could relax by the pool at this home in Port St. Lucie, Florida for $333 a night. Or watch the sunrise at this oceanfront condo in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for $507 a night. Or enjoy the view from the hot tub at this luxury chalet in Steamboat Springs, Colorado for $1325 a night. These rentals all big enough to share with another family. It's a popular travel trend as many look to give their wallets a break this spring. The average family of four now spends more than $4,500 on a vacation each year. But by buddying up at a home share, you can split the cost with others, saving you money while making priceless memories. Last year, Airbnb reporting family travel nearly doubled to 98% in the U.S. alone. And a recent Verbo survey finding this year, 57% of travelers plan to take trips more often with groups of friends. To rent a big, huge, you know, three floor house or cabin would have not made financial sense. So splitting it with a family was perfect. Karen Ensley, her husband Will, and their daughter Sienna escaped to the great outdoors with some friends in the Pocono Mountains. After discussing their budgets, the two families searched Airbnb to find a spacious cabin within their price range. We wanted to make sure we had enough space so that the two families could be together but separate. Ensley says they took in the sights and the savings, as the outdoor toys included with the rental provided entertainment. The families also split the grocery bill. It ends up being cheaper than a hotel. But when vacationing, the phrase, the more the merrier, doesn't always apply. Travel preparedness expert Cheryl Nelson says before booking a shared space, discussing the details can help ensure everyone goes and comes back as friends. What about if you're traveling with another family on a shared vacation? What are some tips to make it out of that <laughs> intact? There's got to be some house rules that you set. Are there quiet hours? Agree on that. What about pets? Don't bring your dog if somebody else is bringing their cat. And kids, how are the kids going to play? Talk about the budget, how much space you need, and if you want to split the cost per family or per person. Nelson even suggests assigning rooms ahead of time. A lot of the times there's only one, maybe two master suites in the house. You don't want everybody fighting over that when they get there. Other topics to consider, how to split food costs, how much time to spend together and apart, sleep habits, and as Ensley learned, who does the chores? If one family's cooking, maybe the other one cleans that day and, and you kind of switch back and forth. When considering a home rental, Nelson says make safety a priority. Only rent from verified hosts. Read all the reviews about that property. You can also check out the surrounding area by entering the address on a street view map. And one more tip, you can see the recent serious crimes there if you put the address into crimemapping.com. What are some red flags you should look for in a listing? If they don't provide any sort of picture of a doorway or external pictures, that might raise a red flag. Nelson shows us her first safety check. Does the rental have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide alarm? You can also bring your own. This one's portable. All you do is plug it into the wall. She then uses a flashlight to look for hidden cameras. Ideally, I'd close the blinds, lights would be off. And as I'm lounging, I would just start pointing this at vents. If you see anything reflecting back at you, there might be a hidden camera in there. And she checks drawers for sharp objects and drugs or chemicals. Tips to keep your home share travels full of good, clean family fun. Still to come, how to avoid paying extra airline fees and later, deal or no deal, how to find the best prices at your grocery store. We're back after this.
Welcome back. Consumers are already battling inflation, and now it seems we're also seeing more of those so-called junk fees charged by airlines. NBC's Tom Costello spoke to our friends on the Today Show about a new policy that could make flying cheaper. It's a travel hassle familiar to any family traveling with kids. Either shell out the extra cash for seat selections up front or try to wing it at the gate. Now United Airlines is rolling out a new seating policy to make the skies a bit friendlier, allowing accompanying parents and adults to sit next to children younger than 12 without paying extra. That's a big deal for parents like Nathan Herrig and his family of four. It takes away one of the most stressful parts of flying, which is, you know, uh, what am I going to do with my kids on the flight? Along with the ticketing policy, United says it's also unveiling new technology that will open up more seats on its flights to help automatically keep younger children next to an adult in their party, giving access to regular economy seats and preferred seats if needed. No extra fee. It's not uncommon to see seat selection as much as 50, 60 or $70 per person. And so if you're talking about a family of four, that can run well over $200 just to reserve your specific seat. The new feature will be available to families purchasing either regular tickets or basic economy tickets, which typically have more restrictions. The move comes as regulators, lawmakers and the White House have taken sharp aim at so-called junk fees that airlines charge. We'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. The airline industry says carriers try to seat families together, often at the gate, but families sometimes buy seats together that cost more. Experts say United's new boarding tool should remove some of the boarding stress for families. It's going to be better for uh, airline gate agents who don't have to try to play musical chairs. All right, Tom, some good tips, but if families are booking with other airlines outside of United, how can they avoid that seating yeah. fee? Now, let's walk through a couple of tips for you. Uh, first of all, you should try to call the airline in advance. If you're going ahead and booking online, First of all, try to see if you can book together. That may be difficult, but give it a shot. Call the airline in advance. Explain to them you're traveling with young kids. And if that doesn't work or if they simply can't help you, the agent at the gate, hopefully, at the airport can help you as well. And here's a good tip. If you're traveling with kids, try to choose maybe a seat, all seats in the back of the plane. Those usually don't fill up as fast, and usually those are not premium seats. It's easier to get seats together. Closer to the bathroom, yeah, too, by the way. Yeah. In that case, with little kids, not a bad thing. How about baggage fees? Because those can really add up, too, Tom. Well, you know, if you have status, if you fly a lot, usually your status will allow you to check a bag for free. But those airline credit cards usually will give you at least one, sometimes two bags for free. So consider that using a credit card for the airline that you're on. Also compare the policies. Not all airlines charge to check bags. Southwest still does not. So you might want to be looking and considering whether that's a factor. And then if you want to try to avoid that checking the bag fee, you might want to try to carry on and then check the bag at the gate. However, your bag can't be so big it doesn't fit through the TSA x-ray machine. It's not just airlines that are tacking on those fees, hotels, concerts, even banks too. So how can we avoid extra fees? NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently shared some ways to cut down on costs. All right, so we're going to take it one step at a time by the by the numbers. Let's start with those dreaded banking fees. What are we working with here? Yeah, well, it costs a lot to use plastic Chanel. And the number I've got for you here is $29.80. Okay. That number comes from bank rate. That's how much it costs to overdraft. You don't have enough money in your checking account. The bank has to move from your savings account, and that's going to cost you a lot of money. So that make sure up. you have enough in your checking account. Yeah, but look, yeah. there's a lot of other fees that are associated with using bank services as well. Okay. ATM fees, $4.66. Per what? 
per transaction. That's also according to bank rate. So if you want to avoid that, try to stay inside your debit card network. Take a look at the back of the plastic to make okay. sure you know where to use it. And then there's okay. also credit card late fees, right? <laughs> On top of the interest that you're going to pay for anything that's overdue, you're also yep. going to get this late fee of about $30. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is actually proposing under the Biden administration to cap that at $8. Really? And, yep, and the CFPB, again, it's a proposal right now, okay. but they say that could save Americans about $9 billion. And by the way, <laughs> Chanel, for all these fees, if you do face it, try to give your bank a call. Just say, hey, look, I'm really sorry about that. Maybe can you waive it? I've done it before with the overdraft Right, especially fee. if it's just one time. Exactly. And yeah, the worst you, they could do, say no. Say no. Yep, okay, exactly. to save that money. All right, next, let's talk about, this is a good one, the extra cost yes. we pay for cable yep. and internet. <laughs> yeah, really expensive. And, and the number I've got for you right here is 11.3%. That's the estimated inflation that we've seen just since the beginning of the pandemic for your cable fees. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's on top of what Consumer Reports estimated was $450 in yearly cable fees that people are paying. So fees, and not just wow. the... Just well, the, that is actually the bill, but oh, it that's includes the bill. fees, which okay. I'm going to get to right here. Company-imposed fees as part of that are about 24%, according to uh, mm -hmm. Consumer Reports. But I feel now, like it feel, you feel helpless. Like, you get the bill, and you have all those fees on there. What are you supposed to do? Well, you, you, I mean, you can call the cable company and try to yeah. see if you can negotiate some of those fees, but there are things like, for example, modem rentals. They'll okay. say, you have to rent from us. That could be up to $15 a month. You could buy your own modem, your own router mm -hmm. from Best Buy, for example, and then yeah. save yourself the monthly fee okay. and also watch out for cancellation fees if you try to get out of a contract early could be up to two hundred dollars but again try to give your cable company a call and also maybe consider cutting the cord if it's going to save you money just by streaming instead of buying a cable but those Sorry. streaming those streaming services have all been Sorry, jacking up yeah, all yeah, exactly yeah, so you got to do the math and try to see based off of what channels you want whether or not it ends up working out. all right it's crazy. All right, so if you actually get off the couch yep. and leave the house, we all want to do experiences. There's concerts, there's games, but the fees attached to ticketing is yep. also up. Dylan, so the number I've got for you is 27 to 31%. That's the average ticket fee. This is where we feel a lot of the pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of T-Swift fans will know this as well, <laughs> right? Now, let's do the math, right? Average concert ticket, according to uh, Polestar, is $108.20. So with another fee on top of that, mm -hmm. that's going to be another $30 just right. to get into the stadium. Average NBA game, I'm a huge Brooklyn Nets fan. I know this for a fact. $94, but again, the fees are mm -hmm. added on top of that. It's very expensive just to get inside the Barclays Arena. And then the average discount theater tickets, this is according to Today Ticks Group. They're saying it's about $55. That's not just Broadway, that's nationally, mm -hmm. by the way. Again, you're going to face fees on top of that. But so, no, what can you do for that? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to go directly to the box office. In many cases, you can get around these third-party ticket mm -hmm. resellers to get around the fee. And then also remember that you can actually try to join a fan club, for example. Okay. They might offer discounted oh, tickets. Oh, that's a good idea. Well. What ticks yeah. me off is when you go and you buy your movie ticket online and they charge you a convenience yes. fee? Yeah, convenience What's fee. What's up with what? that? What's so convenient yeah, about that right now? <laughs> you have fewer cashiers because I'm buying online. Stop it! <laughs> anyway, uh, travel fees. Yes, yes. So what's the number well, there? Well, look, I get worked up just as much about travel fees as well. 30 to $35, that is the average airfare fees just for trying to pick your seat, just mm -hmm. to try to check your bags. Right. Things you can get around, try to check the bag maybe directly at the gate. I've got other numbers for you as well. Airport car rentals, another 23% more expensive to rent at the airport. Yeah. Oh, wow. Consider taking an Uber into a downtown location. Uh -huh. Renting from the same place mm -hmm. could be a lot cheaper. Resort fees, $40 just Can for Can you that. negotiate those? Eh, it's kind of tough, but the Biden administration is looking at perhaps nixing mm -hmm. these fees and then Airbnbs. This is where it gets, I mean, everyone's experiencing mm -hmm. this. 14.2% could be the fees on top of what you're quoted. Wow. Yeah. Check the card. Try to check out so you get a mm -hmm. final invoice and how much that's going to cost Brian you. Chung, great good advice. Thanks so it much. Yep. Coming up, how to stretch your dollars at the grocery store, plus what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants.
With more Americans turning to discount stores to cope with high food prices, many traditional grocery stores are trying to lure back customers by pushing their own store brands and expanding loyalty programs. Here's how you can find the best deals. In aisles all across America, grocery shoppers are doing a double take. That's not even a cart full of groceries. As inflation sent food prices soaring, now more than half of all Americans, a whopping 60 percent, prefer non-traditional stores. Wholesale clubs like Costco or super centers such as Target and Walmart are often the go-to destination for food shoppers. That's causing a shuffle on the shelves. Some retailers to stay competitive for consumers are going to put items that are staple items on sale. They're also upping rewards on loyalty programs. As the grocery wars heat up, traditional chains like Kroger are leaning into their ability to provide fresh produce and relying on reputation to establish their own brand loyalty. What we find is uh, customers going from national brand to our brands and a customer is able to save seven to 10 percent on a basket of goods when they buy our brands. They're also leaning into digital coupons, a big hit with shoppers. For us, our business model is designed to be successful regardless of the environment. The changing landscape can mean good news at the checkout. Stores like Aldi, which continue to expand, entice customers with cheap prices on popular brands. I think the prices are really good and they have a lot of good options. And I really like the frozen food section. I save about $100 at least a month. Discount stores are making a deep dent, too. I spent $35 on a week's worth of groceries at Dollar Tree. With one in five people shopping for groceries at Dollar Chains. They want you to see that they have the exact same quality of a name brand for much less. And often you'll see a comparison between the two prices, two big stickers right next to each other. Retailers like Dollar Tree are even remodeling some stores to showcase groceries and kitchen staples and partnering with delivery app Instacart to reach new customers. With so many choices, if you want to keep your grocery budget in check, experts suggest jump on those buy one, get one offers for your essential goods and freeze what you don't use. Set up a meal plan for the week to limit overspending. And don't forget to take advantage of those loyalty programs that can cut costs in line. Take a beat before you go to the grocery store and really do the research. You will be so surprised how much money you can save. Now to a closer look at big changes happening in the food industry. Some restaurants are offering deals like subscription services and extra perks to keep customers coming back. NBC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest. From chicken to beef to eggs, the price you pay for food at the grocery store remains high. And restaurants, big and small, are feeling that same sting from inflation. Food is getting outrageous. Many businesses have been forced to pass on those costs to consumers, making the price you pay for dine-in and takeout meals more expensive. 8% more than you paid for the same meals last year. That ballooning bill, the main reason over 60% of Americans say they're choosing to eat out less often. I feel like I'm paying more money for either not very much food or not very good food. Now restaurants are trying to turn down the heat on inflation while still cooking up deals for their customers. Some restaurants are even offering subscription plans. At Asian food chain P.F. Chang's, patrons can now pay $6.99 a month for exclusive loyalty perks, including double reward points, jumping to the front of the waitlist for a table, and free delivery. Industry insiders say that new revenue stream will help relieve some of the inflation stress on businesses. Have you all had to adjust your prices to reflect inflation costs? There's no secret that prices had to be adjusted, not only at our restaurant, but really everywhere, right? At this location in Los Angeles, employees say they're firing up more meals for P.F. Chang subscribers every day. Do you feel that people are really saving money by paying a subscription fee? I believe so. If you're a loyal customer and this is the place that you go to all the time, it's definitely worth it. At Panera Bread, a $120 annual subscription will get you into its unlimited sip club, where drinks and deliveries are available without any additional fees. Some smaller chains and local restaurants are thinking outside the box, offering inflation-conscious menus with options that are cheaper than a full-price plate. And restaurant operators 
are becoming pretty innovative in terms of how they operate in this extremely high cost environment. If you're looking to dine out without breaking the bank, look for daily specials, which often offer a side and a drink for less. Opt for a late lunch instead of a more expensive dinner portion. And if you plan to carry out, see if you can order directly online or through the restaurant's app to help avoid extra delivery fees. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on, it's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England, as they say on the boat, 
they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington state could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples. And that's it, where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago. And that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily. And I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid-20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall.
There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe, okay? And the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we, we treat these like eggs and oh. we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was going to look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, OK, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together.
for you. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers, and our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. So once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity, she just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. Honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, proving it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so Thank you. much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of uh, flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. 
I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody <laughs> loved it. Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best spot. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> No, it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by, by K. K. Thank y'all. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy, candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, home. Her kids, her first taste tester. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. 
there's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely going to support it. It's going to become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating and it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival. The turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of, you know, either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. 
And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Mm -hmm. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. Good morning, welcome to The Boost. Happy to be filling in while Hood is on vacation. Do you know what today is? It's National Puppy Day. And we're celebrating man's best friend with some stories that will leave you smiling, proving the power of puppy love. First, we share the inspiring story behind one community's beloved pet adoption center. Nothing brings joy, companionship, and love. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. Quite like a dog, which is why Sue Bell created Homeward Trails in Fairfax Station, Virginia. Her mission to find forever homes for as many of these adorable animals as possible. It's been 20 years since you founded Homeward Trails and you've rescued over 43,000 animals. Tell me about how it all began. I was vacationing in West Virginia. We drove by a building where there were a bunch of dogs tied up outside and we saw that it was the local animal control. So we stopped to donate some biscuits and we found out that their animal uh, shelter had been hit by a flash flood and they had lost 50 animals who had drowned. Determined to help, Sue took home three dogs that day with a mission to find them homes. From there, it snowballed. And then I became obsessed and turned it into a nonprofit organization uh, with the goal of rescuing 50 animals to pay it forward for the 50 animals who drowned. But I reached that number 50 a lot quicker than I thought. And once I did, I was hooked. Homeward Trails also provides the animals with much needed medical and behavioral care. How does it feel to be working with animals? Um, when it's good, it's good. Um, there, are, there are days where we wish they could just talk to us. It's fantastic when you have that breakthrough. When you take a dog who has been abused or who has been neglected or shut down and see them literally start to trust, to start to appreciate the grass and the sunshine, it's transformative. Describe the feeling you feel when you see a dog go into their forever home. Just a really warm feeling, knowing that they're going to go on to be the center of that family's attention. So you fostered six dogs, mm -hmm. adopted two. Yes. Uh -huh. Those were Ray and Tyra. Yeah, they're total opposites. <laughs> Ray is a 70-pound black lab mix. Tyra is a feisty six-pound little pup. My partner Jake decided that since she stands on her back legs and has the short little arms, we should name her Tyra for Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> So, seeing those dogs have the shot at life and love that they deserve, those are the dogs that keep us all going. So this is your dog? Yep, this is Mia. Oh, She Hi, came to me just a couple years ago. What does Sue mean to the community? She's a force. She's one of those people that's you know, boots on the ground. She goes and does it herself. She doesn't just sit somewhere and direct. What do you hope is next for Homework Trails? If I'm going to be honest, I would love to go out of business. I would love that every animal has a home and that the shelters and the rescues could all shut down. You don't hear many founders say that they want to go out of business. I know. <laughs> I feel grateful all the time for Ray and Tyra. Ray was found as a stray. Tyra was dropped to be euthanized. And now here they are. These like full, beautiful lives that you would just have no idea. There's so many animals in shelters waiting for families who will see them as full, beautiful stories. For me, there's no better feeling, and that's what's kept me in this for, for 20 years. It never gets old. Given Sue's dedication to animals, we were excited to let her in on a little secret. Sue, we are surrounded by so many people who love you and appreciate all that you do here at this adoption center. Um, I actually wanted to fill you in on a little secret I have, but to do that, I need some help. Okay. Mia? Mia, come over here. Hi, Mia. Come here, Mia. <laughs> Our sponsor, Fresh Pet, heard about all the amazing work that you do to help improve the lives of so many dogs that they want to present Homer Trails with a $20,000 donation.
there's one more thing. Oh my god. Our sponsor, Fresh Pet, also knows how many you have to feed when caring for all these dogs that they are also going to donate 1,000 meals over the course of a year. Oh my god. Next, some good dogs doing good deeds. The Good Dog Foundation is an organization that trains therapy dogs to help people of all ages. Take a look. At PS33, an elementary school in Manhattan, they're redefining teacher's pet with a dog named Oliver. He really is a rock star here. He's a superstar. Oliver. The popular Labrador is actually more of a student's pet. No parent is going to believe this pigtail story. Frequently visiting the school and sitting in on reading classes. When I read to Oliver, he's somebody that actually listens to me. He knows like what people are saying when you read to him. <laughs> and that is why Oliver's owner, Martha Gold, has been bringing the dog here for the past four years. No judgment from a dog. The kids that feel funny about reading in public or even speaking in public feel good with him. Hi. Oliver is a product of the Good Dog Foundation. Sit. Stay. Which trains up to 300 therapy dog teams a year. Dogs like Harvey. He seems very nice. <laughs> His owner, Nicole Lakin, just knew this was the tiny pup's calling. He walked up to somebody in a wheelchair and stuck his head up into the guy's hand so that he could pet him. And I was like, well, that was pretty impressive. So you told her, <laughs> right? Pretty much. That's pretty much the way our relationship works. <laughs> Good boy. Good stay. The canine students and their owners take four classes focused on basic obedience and impulse control. They can communicate through body language and eyes contact, and so, <laughs> like that. Laska, a magnetic Siberian husky, just graduated in March and went right to work. From that moment, it was love at first sight. <laughs> Laska and his owner, Emily Kay, visit the new Jewish home, a nursing home in New York, every week. It seemed like when you need them, they're there for you. That's as important to our healing as the medicine I take. So socializing with Laska can help you heal too. Oh yeah, that is written in stone as far as I'm concerned. I mean, look at this. Look at that, look at that. Back at PS33, the principal says thanks to Oliver, her students' reading skills are flourishing. There's a connection that Oliver has with all the students that really feeds into their souls and spirits. Companionship that goes beyond language, courtesy of good dogs who are good for humans. They just, you know, see what's in front of them and, and they love us no matter what. The love of a pet can be truly transformative and this program at a maximum security prison for women is proving just that, allowing inmates to train puppies to become service dogs. Deep inside a maximum security prison for women, just north of New York City, a sound you might not expect. <laughs> That's right, puppies. Behind the big house, things are looking a lot like, well, the dog house. Meet McDonald, a two-year-old pup who spent his whole life living here in Crystal Beasley's cell. Beasley is serving 10 years for assault. Training McDonald, taking care of him, feeling his love, she says is helping her trust people again. Has McDonald changed doing time, what that means to you? Yeah, he has. He let me feel again. He taught me how to love again. But in a way, what you're describing is raising a dog to be a therapy dog is therapy in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Crystal and McDonald are not alone. For more than 20 years, inmates have trained more than 1,200 dogs to work as service dogs through the not-for-profit Puppies Behind Bars. Dogs like Scout. Scout, salute. And Angel. Ultimately, each dog is given to a veteran or first responder struggling with PTSD or other issues. Each dog knows close to 100 commands, including turning off the lights yes. and helping someone grab a drink of water, designed to help and comfort their people. This day is a happy but hard one, puppy graduation. 
The dogs are poised to leave the inmates who raised them, going home with the vets and first responders who will be their forever families. And this year, a first. McDonald is the first dog to ever be given to an active duty police officer. Good boy. Heather McClellan is taking him back home to Groton, Connecticut. You don't have PTSD. I you do not. You don't personally need a service dog. Right. I mean, he's really going to be a member of the force. He is. He is. And, and you know, we're refer referring to him as a police service dog. He's going to help our officers as they, you know, make their way through some, some really difficult incidents. You know, there's all kinds of research that shows petting a dog lowers your blood pressure. Right. Right. I mean, there's something that a dog can bring to a person or situation that um, nobody else can really bring. A couple weeks after McDonald settled in as a member of the Groton Force, we went for a visit. Could one dog make a difference? Dispatch. Jackie Kilby Richards has been a dispatcher for 33 years. Tell me a story, McDonald, That's it. buddy. Uh -huh. Her answer is yes. So why is it helpful? It's just unconditional love and the feeling of there's no, no pressure. Officer McClellan tells us mental health is a priority with staggering numbers of police suicides across the country, well over 160 so far this year. Has Groton had anybody? Thankfully, we have not. And even though it hasn't hit us, and, and hopefully never will, uh, every time we lose an officer to suicide, uh, it, it strikes a chord in all of us. Chief Louis Fasaro knows firsthand how emotionally devastating the job can be. He was the tactical commander of the state police during the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary. You know, traumatic events like that um, certainly play a role in an officer's, you know, the rest of their career, how that, how that impacts them individually. And he's delighted to welcome McDonald to his team. It goes beyond just our officer wellness. That's the primary point. There's so many, uh, so many other uh, uh, benefits to this that I think that we're going to see in the coming years. The smiles that welcome McDonald inside the police station clearly extend outside it. <laughs> and while kisses are welcome, even they can sometimes get to be too much. If he gets up and wants to walk away, that means he's probably a little overwhelmed. A lot of love for a pup set to serve. A sweet life that all started behind bars with a woman serving time. I've never started anything and finished anything. Until now. I still am trying to process it all, like I really did this. I'm just, I'm proud of myself and I'm proud of him. Welcome back to The Boost. For a lot of high school seniors, that college application process can be daunting. So, one organization is trying to make it a little easier for students by enlisting the help of their own peers. And the impact is life-changing. That wasn't there when I was in school. This one, yeah? For Dariel Vasquez, Harlem will always be home. Harlem is the best place in the world. 
it's everything that I am. For ninth grade, I was really rough around the edges and trying to find myself. Tenth grade became more of the young man that I feel like could make a difference in my community. In the summer of his senior year, Darielle had the opportunity to connect with Peer Forward, a group whose goal is to support high schoolers as they navigate the process of applying to college. Mentoring was the factor that changed my life. Having these older figures in my life that looked like me, that were from where I'm from, um, who believed in me. And one of those people who saw something in Darielle was Gary Lennon, his Peer Forward leader at the time. Everybody kind of sits in a circle and we get asked to like check in. How are you feeling? What's on your mind? And that was probably one of the most life-changing experiences. Other young men who were really opening up and being vulnerable. We had a similar connection. Him being from the west side, I'm from the east side, both from the projects. And we're like, hold on. We are young, you know, men of color that are thriving. And sometimes people just don't see us, but we see each other. What Peer Forward discovered is that when students are faced with making decisions about college, sometimes the best people to help are fellow high school students. So Peer Forward provides the training. A lot of times, we don't look at students as uh, problem solvers. We look as they are problems to be solved. And we inverted that. Like, leverage them to solve the problems for you. After serving as a peer leader in his high school and graduating, Darielle attended his freshman year at Bard College in upstate New York. But the transition wasn't easy. I almost dropped out my first year undergrad. I kind of felt like hometown hero, all this being invested in me. The culture shock was immense. So that's when he put into practice everything he'd learned from Gary and Peer Forward. Being a part of spaces where I could open up and be vulnerable with a brotherhood, with my peers, changed my life. What if we just recreated this for ourselves? As like 18 and 19 year olds, we went to a local high school and we said, you know, like, hey, we wanna start mentoring, you know, your high schoolers. We feel like we have the potential to you know, influence them. My mentees helped me get through college just as much as I helped them get through high school. After receiving a grant through the My Brother's Keeper Initiative, established by President Obama, Dariel officially founded the nonprofit called Brothers At. Our mission is to get more young men of color to and through college and position them to be change agents in their communities. There's nothing like having a 19-year-old talk to a 15, 16-year-old and be like, I'm from the South Bronx, from Harlem, but I just like studied abroad in Italy. Hearing that from somebody who's like two or three years older than you, you're like, oh yeah, like the world is mine. In a full circle moment, Gary and Dariel met up with peer forward leaders at Thurgood Marshall Academy in Harlem, where Dariel graduated 10 years ago. How do y'all feel about starting college in a few months? Nervous. Yeah, yeah I'm nervous. Why do y'all even want to go to college? As a first generation, it's like a stepping stone for my family. I wanted to be able to experience new people. Also, it would help aid me to like grow as a better person. I feel like I need to set an example for my younger siblings and also the people that look up to me. I gotta show them that you can actually succeed with the right opportunities and the right mindset. Peer Forward is on track to impact more than 1.8 million students by 2025. And this year, Brothers At plans to expand to colleges in three more cities. But Gary and Darielle remember where it all started for both of them. I think the opportunities were always there, but it, sometimes you just can't see it. And that's what we're doing. It's providing individuals the chance to be able to see it in front of them. It's more of a story of like making sure that we remember to always take chances on our young people and believe in them. The adults in my life audaciously believed in me and took a chance on me in my future. Up next, a university with a purpose to bring higher education to the masses without breaking the bank. Mr. Roker has that story. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shai Reshef, and I'm the president of University of the People. In 2010, education entrepreneur Shai Reshef visited the people of Haiti to introduce himself and his novel idea. The University of the People is the first nonprofit tuition free online university dedicated to open the gates to higher education for everyone. Shai spending his career in for-profit education, running test prep and computer training centers. Among other things, I started the first online university in Europe. That's where I saw how powerful online learning can be. When he sold his company in 2005 and semi-retired, Shai wanted to give back. 
he saw learning as the perfect opportunity, Shai shelling out $1 million of his own money to make his vision a reality. I believe that higher education is a basic right for all. And I believe that there wasn't a better reason for the invention of the internet than bringing education to people wherever they are. His innovative model to provide affordable and accessible higher education to anyone who wanted it, regardless of their financial circumstances. And now is one of the fastest growing online universities in the world, with more than 117,000 students from 200 countries and territories. Our largest country is the U.S., but we have students from Africa, we have students from Asia, and we have a lot of refugees. We took more refugees than any university in the world. We have people who are uh, stay-home moms, unemployed, undocumented, people who simply work and cannot accommodate uh, the rigid schedule of universities, and they come to us, they have the flexibility. That's exactly what drew Elise Deer to University of the People. The Colorado native had no college education and no clear career path, but she had higher aspirations. Through a Google search, she stumbled upon University of the People. Before I had my first child, I was looking for an opportunity to attend college and I didn't want to go into an extreme amount of debt to receive higher education. I wouldn't have been able to do a traditional program where I needed to sit in a classroom because I had two children. So I was filling in my study time in, during nap time. Last year, Elise graduating with a bachelor's degree in business administration, now working as a software person at a huge tech company. Without University of the People, I certainly wouldn't be at the company that I work for. I certainly would not be uh, really in a dream career. With a 92% job placement rate, University of the People uses a full faculty of volunteers, all with a common goal. We have teachers, professors that are coming from the best universities of the world with the desire to help students who need education and cannot get it. And it's very simple. When you help someone, you get so much more to yourself, to your heart. His heartfelt message is what has helped his students succeed both in school and as members of society. We had different opinions on what was important, so it helped me to really have a global mindset in terms of my future role and the future jobs I would take on and also just how I view day-to-day -day life. Shai estimates doubling enrollment by 2025, and he says that's just the beginning. I hope that one day every single person in the world will have the opportunity for higher education. If we are succeeding in doing that, not only that the students will have better futures and their families and their community, we will have a better world. When we come back, we're going to have more stories to boost your day. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Boost. Have you ever connected to the lyrics of a song as if the song could have been written specifically for you? Meet songwriter Mike Law. He writes and composes tiny anthems, ballads for everyday people, turning real stories about real people into personalized tunes. I think we know how this story begins. In a tiny basement studio in Portland, Oregon. All social decorum is abandoned at sea because though the place is empty, she moors next to Deb's seat. There's something special about the lyrics floating in the air. They're still strangers at this point, though they've been here a thousand times. This modern day bard is writing ballads about ordinary everyday people. Tiny anthems is a system where you give me information about your sister or your husband or your cousin Greg. Ugh, Greg. And based on what you tell me, I will then compose a song. And it all started with an offer to write a song about anyone for two bucks. First, you turn on this light, you set the switch to dwell, then you turn these switches up to ten, and then. Well, this one's actually a washing machine. And quickly snowballed into Mike Long's life's work. Today, Mike charges about $300 per song, putting more than 20 hours each into the composition. There's just like something absurd about what I'm doing that just makes me want to keep doing it. Dev's a grain and gristle when Sid comes sailing in. He's now written and composed hundreds of tiny anthems, each created for an audience of one. I've never experienced a gift like that before in my life. And I imagine I may not ever again. Incredible, one of a kind. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> For Deb Sirk and Sid Snyder, Tiny Anthems has become the soundtrack of their lives. And get this, a few weeks before their wedding in October, Mike got two identical requests. I thought it was gonna be a gift to Sid for our wedding and it'd be just kind of about her. So unbeknownst to you, you were also commissioning a song. Yeah, little did I know he'd already been writing it for a week. I think we all know how their story begins. Then he just surprised us with a song right after the ceremony. He literally popped out from behind a pillar. There are very few people in this world that have a love song written about them. That is so true, and we have three of them. And Mike's creative process can be as unpredictable as his lyrics. His orchestra, just about anything that makes a sound. And watching him create music from thin air is simply magical. Moments later, yet another sound ready to celebrate that indescribable essence that makes each one of us so unique. If you get close enough to a person, you'll find something to love about them. For Sunday Today, Gotti Schwartz, Portland, Oregon. Coming up, the latest viral video to boost your debt. Welcome back. We've got one more video here on The Boost that's sure to put a smile on your face. Take a look. 
Let's do this thing. A woman celebrating her 60th birthday thought she was going for a special family dinner. They even rented a limo, but she had no idea who was waiting inside. We'll get a picture after. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that limo was packed with her closest friend, oh, champagne in hand. Sweet. She thought it was going to be a family dinner. It was actually ladies' night oh, out. That's cute. That's we, good... we ladies, we love that's a night out, yeah. do we right. not? That's all for today. Thanks for joining us. We're going to see you next time with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Dovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day Spring Cleaning Guide. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock and we are back with a new episode of Shop All Day. This episode is our ultimate spring cleaning guide featuring must-have cleaning products, noteworthy new gadgets, and easy organization hacks. Plus, all the spring fashion finds that are gonna make your closet clean out a little bit more fun. See that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to all the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. First up, let's talk about cleaning in the kitchen. This find is a two-in-one tool that is perfect for pots, pans, even cleaning the crevices in the kitchen. Meet the Scrub Daddy. The Scrub Daddy got its claim to fame on Shark Tank in May of 2014 and was actually named the show's most successful product to date, according to the brand, and it held that title until 2021. The Scrub Daddy was born out of its creator's struggle to keep his hands clean while working with machinery. It is the shape shifter of kitchen sponges. So in cold water, it hardens for tough scrubbing, and in hot water, it softens to gently clean. It can be used on every kind of surface, from glass to wood, and the brand says it's not gonna leave a scratch. The smiley face design is actually intentional too. You can use the mouth to clean spoons and utensils or stick it inside a cup to clean all sides at once. Next up is a tried and true kitchen classic. It's the OXO soap dispensing brush, but we found a new and improved way to put this to work. Thanks to social media. It might seem basic, but don't doubt this tool. It's multi-purpose. It's a scrubber that you're gonna wanna use basically in every room in the house. In the kitchen, it's great for scrubbing bottles and nearly anything with a lid, including Tupperware. And in the bathroom, you can use it to clean tub or tiles and grout, even while you're in the shower if you really want to multitask. And all you have to do is fill it up with your favorite cleaning product, whether it's dish soap, soap scum remover, diluted bleach, and it'll help you clean every nook and cranny in the kitchen or bathroom. All right, moving on to a couple of clever products that are great for multi-purpose cleaning. First up is a Shop Today reader favorite, and you may have already heard about it. It is called the Pink Stuff. This stuff went viral on TikTok last year, and the Shop Today team has been obsessed with it ever since. It's called a miracle paste for a reason. It revived one of our editors' nonstick pans with minimal effort. And more than 78,000 Amazon reviewers have given it a full five-star rating, so you know it's gotta be good. The formula is actually gentle enough to clean shoes, but it can also be used to tackle grimy spots in your bathroom. And the brand has also launched a brand new miracle scrubbing kit, which comes with a battery operated brush tool. Kind of like an electric toothbrush for cleaning any surface. Check out how it works. It comes with four brush heads that are adjustable and they can tackle anything you need to clean. Think bathroom grout, cooktops, the grill, or even those white sneakers you wanna keep squeaky clean this spring. Next up is a genius update to your everyday mop that the Shop Today team discovered on Instagram. Check out how it works. It is self-wringing. All you have to do is pull it and the cleaning cloth twists tightly to wring itself out. It eliminates the need to carry around a big bucket and it does all the work for you. 
Since it comes with two towels, you can use one for dusting and the other for mopping. Next, we found a couple of really unique products that can help you clean some of those spaces you didn't know or maybe you didn't want to think about. First is the Air Squares Earbud Cleaning Putty. This product helps you clean something that you probably don't talk about, but it seems like earbuds are nearly impossible to clean. And this genius viral TikTok sensation is a total game changer. The brand says the putty can soak up dirt and debris right from the nooks and crannies of your earbuds, so you can finally clean them, and also it can be used on hearing aids, remote controls, and other small tech accessories that use a deep clean. Each pack comes with 24 putty squares, so you can use them and toss them right away. Moving along, while this might look like a messy slime that so many kids love these days, it actually helps clean up messes rather than make them. It is an inventive cleaning gel for all those hard to reach places in your car. I've used it myself and TikTokers went crazy over this gel last summer and it has been a consistent bestseller ever since. According to the brand, all that dirt and gunk in your car's cup holders or air vents, one roll of this gel is gonna clean it right up and we love that it can be reused over and over again. All you have to do is wash it with soap and water and we keep it in the car at all times for quick cleanups. Next, let's talk about laundry. It's a dreaded chore, but these finds are gonna make it a little bit more manageable. First up is a game changer when you're washing bed sheets. I'm talking about the Wad Free Laundry Gadget. My husband loves this one. Everyone knows the struggle of trying to get your sheets completely clean, and so often sheets can get balled up, twisted and tangled in the washer and dryer. Well, thankfully, Wad Free inventor Cindy Bray created this genius tool out of frustration, and it launched less than two years ago. The brand says this gadget's gonna prevent your sheets from tangling up, allowing them to wash and dry more efficiently, and keep them from wrinkling too. This little tool helps everything come out cleaner and it helps items dry 75% faster according to the brand. And finally, if you're someone who always ends up with food or drink on your clothes, listen up. This product makes treating stains a little bit easier. It's the Miss Mouth Messy Eater Spray and Wipes. Many of us know the pain of putting your little one in a brand new shirt only for it to be covered in crumbs, spills, and juice minutes later. That's why we're so happy we stumbled upon this on-the-go stain remover. And this is great for accident-prone adults too. All you have to do is spritz it as a spot cleaner as soon as you see a stain. For my daughter, I spray it immediately onto a stain and wipe it for a quick refresh. Or if your stain is really set in, you could spray and treat the stain for a few hours before dropping it into the wash. Both the spray and the on-the-go wipes are pet and kid friendly and can be used on everything from bibs to furniture, the brand says. At $8 a bottle, it's practically a steal and you're certainly gonna get your money's worth. Reviewers have called it, quote, magical and even say it works on grease and pet stains too. Let's run through the products one more time. We have the Scrub Daddy sponges, the OXO soap dispensing brush, the pink stuff and the brand new Miracle scrubbing kit, the self-ringing mop, the Air Squares Earbud Cleaning Putty, the cleaning gel for the car, the Wad Free Laundry Gadget, and the Miss Mouth Messy Eater Spray and Wipes. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for this edition of Editor's Pay. Up next, Netflix stars and organizing experts Clea Shearer and Joanna Teplin of The Home Edit sit down with Mako with Lovu with their go-to hacks and the perfect organization products for every room in the house.
Welcome back. I'm Makon Lobu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I sit down with industry insiders to learn their expert tips, tricks of the trade, and their favorite products that they're shopping right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products, or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Now, when you're scrolling on social, there are certain spaces that you've no doubt seen. The room is organized to a T, right? And each item has a place, and it's color-coded in a perfect rainbow. That's when you know the Home Edit has been here. Now, joining us are the Home Edit founders, Clea Shearer and Joanna Teplin. The organizing mavens turned Netflix stars are here to help us organize every room in the home with a few simple solutions and the products to make it happen. Hi, Clea and Joanna. Welcome to Shop All Day. Thanks for having us. We're so excited to be a part of this. We're so excited that you're here. All right, let's di let's dive right in. I know it's a little cliche, but why do you think spring is a good time to get organized? Clea, I'll let you take it. Okay, well, I just want to say we're a little biased. We think every season <laughs> is a great time to get organized. Um, but if we need to annualize it to remind people and to give people kind of a focus um, for what they should do, spring is a perfect time. It's, you know, a refreshing moment. It's, the days are longer, it's lighter, it's brighter. I think people feel more motivated in the springtime. Right, people already know in their minds spring cleaning is a thing, and so we are ready to capitalize on that moment. But we like summer cleaning, fall cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly, it's <laughs> holiday time. I mean, we're here for all of it, yeah. but yes. <laughs> I love that. Listen, as organizers, spring is no doubt busy for you both, but you also have this really exciting project that just launched. Tell us about the season two of Get Organized with the Home Edit on Netflix. How exciting! We are so excited. Yeah, we're bursting for the scene. This is such a dream come true to be able to have a second season of our show, and it's filled with so many wonderful families and celebrities. Yes, this season is great. It's a lot of fun projects, a lot of very funny moments, a lot of uh, chaos and um, hectic uh, energy until the very last second. Right. But the reveals are fabulous and uh, hard it. fun. Let me tell you, yes. um, we have, there are a lot of screaming and jumping. Oh, that's so exciting. And congratulations again. You brought up your Walmart line and your container store line. We're going to talk about that in just one second. Let's dive right in. You're here to help us organize every room in the house today. Let's start with the kitchen. Tell me about these pantry canisters from your line with the container store. All right. Well, we love a clear canister, especially in the kitchen. It allows you to remove the packaging, which takes up so much space, and you can't see how much of it, any one item that you have still in there. So by removing it, placing all the contents inside these clear canisters, you can see exactly when you're low on lasagna pasta. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also how many of us have a box of something in the pantry, and that box is taking up this much space, but it only has like one item left in it. You're taking up so much room and removing the packaging again, like Joanna said, you can see everything, you know exactly what you have, you know when you're running low, and you're not creating all this extra bulk space that doesn't need to be there. You're so right on. All right, let's move on to the closet. I know your team is really big on all the hangers, sort of matching. Um, let's talk about why this is helpful in keeping you organized. I love these. So first of all, consistency with your hangers is key. You do not need to gravitate toward one specific type of hanger, although we really like the velvet hangers, a slim hanger. You can see how thin it is. It takes up such little space in the closet, which allows you to hang so much more. Um, but again, if you like other options, there are plenty of options available. Um, just know that you know hangers create bulk. Um, so a slim line hanger is going to save you on space. Um, and you know, it just creates a, a consistent feel. When you walk into a closet and all the hangers are the same, again, whichever hanger you choose, it looks like a store. And as you, I mean, you can see behind me, you know, we also, we do like to Roy G. Fib whenever we have the opportunity. If I'm trying to find my blue jacket, I know exactly where it is. It's lined up in my normal order. So it kind of takes some of that guesswork out and creates a plug and play system for the closet. That is so cool. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Again, aesthetically pleasing to see it just lined up like that. 
The hangers, by the way, come with the clips as well. You can use the clips for what, Joanna, to hang up pants? Absolutely. Yep, use your pants. Yes, and if you okay. get something here that has the bottom bar, you can hang pants over it. You can use pant clips to hang your items separately. You know, mm -hmm. your, your, I, I was going to say endless options, but I guess there are two right. options. Right, there's, there's, there's limited, limited options. options. There's just a couple of good ones. Yes. You know, hanger, hangers have progressed that far. There are, but the, the options are great. I love that. Okay, next up is the bathroom. Listen, the bathroom gets cluttered so easily. I'm not proud to admit it, especially my husband and I, but I'm a beauty lover and I love that you have these items that'll help us really make the most out of the counter space. Tell me about these. We also understand the struggles with, you know, small bathroom space and that people that have collect a lot of bathroom products. We've seen it a few yeah. times. Once or twice. Yeah, just a few times. So we worked with uh, creating this amazing over the, like on the counter drawer solution space that allows you to hold all kinds of different levels of makeup and make sure that you take advantage of the vertical space on top of the counter so that the things are not just flying everywhere and your drawers aren't getting so stuck. And it looks great at the same time. Yes. So you can have a tower of these drawers um, they're meant to fit exactly what they right. are, all sizes. They're so modular, too. Uh, yes, uh, brushes, palettes, um, lip glosses. You can use them for um, other types of beauty products, like serums, whatever you might have. But people are generally short on space in the bathroom. Yes, they are. And this so, allows you to keep working with the vertical space that everyone does have. And I love that it's clear too, because it doesn't matter what your bathroom looks like, whether it's a ton of color or sort of neutral, you can kind of blend it in anywhere. Okay, let's move on to your items from Walmart. Now, under the sink, Oh Lord, that's a place that could get really messy. A lot of us just throw items under there. We forget about them. So tell us about your eight piece multi-purpose edit. How might this come in handy? So first of all, I just want to say, Joanna and I are very passionate about under sink yes. shorts. <laughs> People always sell, sell the under the sink short. They are doing the hard work under, under, the, under the sink. No one works harder no. okay, than under the sink. <laughs> Fine. So the way to best take advantage of, of the under the sink storage opportunity is using clear stackable bins. This is our multi-purpose edit at Walmart, uh, like you mentioned. And not only does it have these open clear stacking bins, but they're actually inserts that go inside them to hold you know, your different levels of towels or cleaners, sponges, whatever it may be. This could be for under the bathroom sink, it could be under the kitchen sink. Wherever you see fit, this allows you to take advantage of the side space around the center pipe, which always kind of uh, perplexes people yes. on, on how to manage that. Um, but you can stack up, go vertically, and then use something shallow where the actual pipe is. And I'm telling you, that area under your sink will shine. It's amazing for fish. It really is. And everybody always sells it short. And whenever we see it, people, sometimes people shove things and other times people don't use it at all. Right. So either way, we have really smart solutions to help solve that. This is such a clever idea. I can't wait to try this out in my own home. And last but certainly not least, can we talk about the laundry room? We have a couple items. Walk us through them. Okay, so the laundry edit, um, also at our Walmart collection, is actually one of my favorite edits that we have. Again, they're all my favorites, so it's like picking children. <laughs> but, uh, but I love the laundry edit because not only is it good for laundry items in the locker room, but you can really use the edit anywhere in the house. This could be great for a pantry. Again, it could be in the bathroom. Right, we sell it as a laundry edit, but that's just a suggestion. Honestly, yeah. any of these are transferable for all, all throughout the house. And the thing that I love about this particular laundry edit, we made these um, stacking bins open front for really easy access, which is great for detergent. Things that are really bulky, um, the, the open bin is a real game changer. It also comes with a turntable. Oh gosh. I love the turntable. How fun is that? It's the most fun. Don't even get us started on a turntable. <laughs> it keeps everything super accessible. Um, again, a turntable is so beautiful. It can be on top of a counter, it can be under a sink, it can be on the shelf, it can be in a cabinet. It's so, so, so versatile. Again, one of the reasons why I love the laundry edit. This is amazing for a pantry too, an open front bin and a turntable. And then these narrow bins, mm. these also come with the edit. And this is a great way to take advantage of that extra bit of space that sometimes, you know, you might not be able to fit two of these side by side, but with the narrow right. bin, you know, you'll you'll be able to fit and maximize your space really, really effectively. And again, everything stacks, it's all modular, right? It all works together. The key is to take advantage of the depth, but also the height. Yes. And that's why we love stackable storage. Yes, again, passionate. <laughs> As you should be. Such great tips. I love these ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. Clea and Joanna, thank you. We appreciate it. And congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the pantry canisters, the non-slip hangers and clips, and the stackable drawers from the container store, 
and we have the eight-piece multi-purpose edit and the five-piece laundry edit from Walmart. Up next, Chassis Post joins us for the ultimate closet cleanout with six spring style staples to refresh your wardrobe this season, including a skirt that you'll wear with everything. That's coming up on Shop All Day. Shop All Day contributor Chastity Post. And we're talking all things spring cleaning today. But when it comes to cleaning and your closet, it's all about going back to basics. So I'm sharing my favorite closet heroes. I have six foundational pieces that set the tone for a most stylish season. And remember, see that QR code on the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today, or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's jump right in and let's talk teas. Never underestimate the power of a great classic tea. It's the ultimate foundation piece and one of my favorite closet heroes, and I think you're really going to like this one. Meet the J. Crew Relaxed Linen T-shirt. It's a customer favorite year after year, and for good reason. This tea elevates the entire category and it's actually made out of linen. I mean, check that out. This already takes this tea and elevates it above the typical tea. And the combination of the crew neck t-shirt style and the fabulous linen fabric makes this tea incredibly versatile. And another thing I love, it comes in so many great colors from your classic white. But if you're looking to buy an extra tea, I would go for the black or, of course, a little pop of color. Bold color is such a big trend right now, so this is a really affordable way to perk up your wardrobe for spring. Moving on to another absolute spring staple, Bohemian Floral Printed Maxi, a fun piece that you can pair 
with basically everything. It's got this fabulous, you know, elastic waistband. It's got a flowy A-line silhouette. It's actually tiered. And check out the little ruffle at the bottom. I love it in the contrasting fabric. And what I love about this skirt is it comes in the midi length, which is perfect for petites, or you could really go for it. It also actually has a maxi length. And of course, you could pair this skirt with that fabulous linen tee we just talked about, or you can dress this skirt up and wear it with a fancy blouse. Next up is a tried and true essential to layer with the skirt and so many of our other closet heroes. Three cheers for the denim jacket. It's also a perfect transitional piece for spring and you can wear it with virtually anything in your closet. And I gotta tell you, one of my favorite things about the denim jacket is it adds a little bit of cool, a little bit of edge to anything you pair it with. And this is a really great example of the trend. It is from Gap Factory. It's called the Icon Denim Jacket. And this is 100% cotton. It's got some great give. It's got everything you look for in a great denim jacket. And it hits just below the hip, which is such a flattering length. And it comes in two great washes, a medium wash and a dark indigo wash. So choose whichever one goes best with what you already have in your closet. And it comes in sizes extra small to XXL. This next one is one of the simplest ways to look pulled together in a snap. Check out these jumpsuits from Daily Ritual. I'm a jumpsuit fanatic because it is one piece dressing at its finest. One and done. I call it a fashion no-brainer because you know it's always going to work. And they come in a couple of different styles. First, this absolutely adorable romper. So we have the wonderful scoop neck and the tank sleeve and this fabric. It is a French terry. I wish you guys could feel it. It is so incredibly soft. And of course, the elastic waistband. Thank you very much. <laughs> and pockets. And check out the wide leg short. They are so flattering. But if shorts aren't your thing, Daily Ritual actually has two other styles with the same top, the very same super soft French terry fabric, but with longer pants. So here, we've got the same elastic waistband, but we've got a longer jogger pant, which I think is so incredibly useful. I mean, wear this traveling, wear this with heels. You're going out at night, right? Wear it with that denim jacket. And they come in lots of great colors. So go bold, go with a fun color. So moving on to shoes, nothing says spring like a cute new sandal, and this versatile find will be your go-to. So these are the braided slide, and these are such a huge trend. So check out the straps here. And the braids, they're actually padded, so it gives them a little bit more dimension. There are lots of styles. So here we have the two-strap X, which I think is really fabulous. We also have the single strap with the braid. And here we have a quadruple strap. How about that? So there are lots of fun styles. And these come in really great neutrals. We've got the light pink, the black, the nude, and a nude slide is going to be the shoe that you turn to pretty much every single day during spring and summer. Plus, these have a really cushy footbed, if you can see that. And it has a lot more support than the typical slide. And I also really like that they have a rubber bottom. And last up, investing in a fresh new sneaker is a great way to ring in your spring in style. And here we have a few styles in a cute platform design. And these are from H&M, and these I just think are so stylish. But I think these sneakers are a more gentle way to get in on the trend because we've got the classic canvas uppers, we've got the lace-ups, but we've got a little lift. It's elongating, it's flattering on the leg, and I can't get over how cute these little espadrille style sneakers are. Check that out. It's not a dramatic platform. It's about an inch and a half, but that's really all you need. So let's run through each of the products again. We have the relaxed linen t-shirt from J. Crew, the bohemian floral printed maxi skirt, the icon denim jackets from Gap Factory, the daily ritual jumpsuits, the braided slide sandals, and the platform sneakers from H&M. And that's it for today's edition of Style Finder and for this episode of Shop All Day. 
Join us right back here next week. We're sharing the best spring style and beauty buys, all under 50 bucks. by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're turning everyday leftovers into brand new dishes for the Today Table. With a little imagination and a few fresh ingredients, we'll show you how to make amazing next day dishes. I'm starting off your morning right with a hearty protein packed quiche. And I'll be whipping up the perfect lunch or anytime snack. Crispy rice cakes with the perfect savory toppings. And I'm making a velvety chocolate mousse with a surprising ingredient. Get ready. Because we're clearing out the fridge. And leaving no leftover behind. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. Whenever I'm doing meal prep, I usually end up with a few leftover ingredients. Today, I'm using some leftover rotisserie chicken to make a quiche with spinach, feta, and sun-dried tomatoes. So, let's get started with our crust. I've got some store-bought pie crust right here, and I'm gonna lightly flour my surface. You don't need too much. All the hard work has been done for us. We're just gonna roll out our pie crust. And be really gentle with it because it is pretty fragile. All right, I'm gonna sprinkle the pie crust with a little bit of flour, and we are going to roll this out. Just gently enlarge it, so that way it'll fit comfortably inside of our pie pan. Okay, I've got this rolled out really nicely, so I'm gonna take my pie pan, I'm just gonna put it right on top of it, just like this. And just take your fingers and lightly go around the edges. I'm telling you, the first time I did this, I felt super accomplished, because I'm like, I'm a baker now. I'm, I'm baking. Mama, look at me. And then you're gonna take these edges that are falling over. You're gonna just fold them up under here, so that way you kind of get an even crust. This is the today, all day kitchen, right? So we're gonna just make it a little bit fancier. So after I get done doing this, we're gonna add some texture and some form to this pie crust. And all you're gonna do, it's a trick I learned. You're gonna take your finger right up under here and crimp it down, press down, and pull it out. Down, and pull it out. All the way like this. And go all the way around the pie crust. I know, the first time I did this, I was like, yo, Kev, look at you. He's a baking machine. And keep going around the edges. All right, got the last one here. All right, now look at this. It looked like it's from a bake shop, right? I know. I did it myself. And you could do it too. So with our pie crust ready, it is camera ready. We're gonna let this rest in the fridge while I prep the rest of the ingredients. Next thing we're gonna prep is our spinach. All right, I'm going to set a stainless steel skillet on a medium high heat. In goes a little bit of water. That's all we wanna see. Watch this, boom. In goes the spinach. It's like the Wizard of Oz. It's melting, it's melting. You shouldn't have to cook the spinach for more than one minute. And boom, this is just about right because I don't want it to be completely mushy. I'm gonna take it out. All right, spinach is cooked. Move on to the other star, the sun-dried tomatoes. All right, we're gonna stack our tomatoes together. Just take a knife. And we're just gonna dice them. Look at all this goodness and they're very fragrant too. Now, moving on to my leftover rotisserie chicken, we're gonna take the skin off of the chicken, peel that back. I know some of y'all are just moaning right now, like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's all right, don't worry, there's still a lot of flavor in this dish and you're not gonna miss it. Just going to make sure that there are no bones in here. 
And you can pull it apart with your hands first, especially if it's cold and left over. If it's warm from just purchasing it, then you may have to use some forks. But I just like to get in there and just use my hands. But of course you do what's most comfortable for you. And try not to do a little bit of this, which I am so guilty of. But you know, a little tasting along the way isn't a bad thing. What home cook doesn't nibble and taste along the way? That's how you know it's good. Let's move on with the recipe. Next part that we have to do, we've got to prep our eggs. So I'm gonna be using some whole eggs. If you are teen lean and mean and you want a wonderful, delicious egg white quiche, mmm, can't wait to wake up to that on the weekend. <laughs> I'm kidding, I eat egg white. But for this one, my leftovers deserve whole eggs. Extra protein, a little extra fat, a little extra love. That's all I'm saying. Add in a little bit of milk. Whisk this up, and we're gonna season it with a little bit of sea salt and pepper for the culture. Boom, salt, pepper. The internet will let you know if you cook unseasoned food right away. And I'm pretty sure our today all day kitchen fam is no different. <laughs> there we go. Now it is time to bring together our beautiful quiche. I'm gonna add in our chicken. Just spread it out. This is gonna be a really meaty protein pack quiche. And you wanna spread it out very well on the pie crust to make sure that every slice gets a little bit of that protein. There we go. Adding in some of our sun-dried tomatoes. Sprinkle those around as well. In goes the spinach. There we go. Our last bit of a protein boost and flavor boost. The feta. Just kind of crumble it up. I bought this crumble, but if you want to buy the entire block, just use a fork to crumble it up on a plate and then do it. There we go. Now, let's give this one more whisk and we're gonna pour in our egg. Watch the slow pour. Getting a little bit more, just some texture on top. Quack pepper. Boom. Look at this beauty. It looks amazing before we've even baked it. This is what we want. We're gonna bake this beauty for about 45 minutes at 350 or until the center is set. I've let this cool for about 15 minutes. It's still really warm, so it's perfect. You can see when I move it, there's no movement there. Let's dig in. I'm gonna give myself a nice, generous portion of this. Oh my gosh, and look how creamy it is. Look at it. The heat has just made that feta just even creamier. I can't wait to dig in. Self-control and portion control is gonna be hard with this one, so don't write me and complain. Kev, I ate the whole thing. <laughs> I understand. Mmm, mmm. I guarantee you, your friends, your family will love this.
Whenever I order takeout, I usually have a ton of rice left over. You could always just reheat and eat what you've got, but I love making crispy rice cakes. So many different cultures have their own version of crispy rice, and now it is all over TikTok, so I cannot wait to show you mine. We are going to start with our rice, and I have three cups right here. So we're gonna add a couple other things to it to boost its flavor and also make sure that it all sticks together and doesn't fall apart when frying. So what we wanna do is we just wanna take some cornstarch right here, and we are going to add in a little bit of water, and then we're actually gonna add in some lemon. We're just going to whisk it on up into a slurry. It smells fabulous, super fragrant. We are going to pour it over the top of the rice. I'm also going to season it with some kosher salt. A nice little three finger pinch. And then we are just going to fold it all together. Here I have an eight by eight square baking dish and I have lined it with some plastic wrap. So we're just going to take that rice, pop it directly into the pan, and with our fingers, which I find clean hands can honestly be the best tools in the kitchen, we are going to just press that rice down into the corners of the pan. Looking good. It is always so much fun to take leftovers and turn them into something new and awesome. I think that a lot of people don't realize the beauty of half of the work already being done for you. We're going to freeze it for at least one hour, up to two hours. And while that's freezing, I'm gonna get some of my toppings ready. I love topping my rice cakes with the perfect soft boiled egg. So I'm gonna show you how to make the perfect one, my little tips and tricks to do it. First thing you wanna do, boil some water. I am going to take a spider, you could also take a slotted spoon, and delicately lower those eggs one by one into the boiling water. While those eggs are going, let's get to work on our lemony scallion yogurt sauce. Starting off, I have two cleaned scallions right here. What we're going to do is we're going to trim off the root of those scallions, and then we will slice them on an angle, also known as a bias, into really thin rounds. So we'll just take that, pop it directly into the sauce, and then we are going to take that lemon half that we have from earlier, squeeze all that juice right into the yogurt, and then we're gonna hit it with a little bit of salt to awaken its flavor. So we're gonna mix this up, and there you go. We have our yogurt sauce. And it almost looks like a looser version of scallion cream cheese. Our eggs are done. We are going to strain them and immediately transfer them into our ice bath. And what the ice bath is gonna do is it's going to shock the eggs and immediately stop them from continuing to cook. Another thing that I love about an ice bath is as that egg cools, what's going to happen is the white is going to slowly pull back from the shell, creating a really thin layer that will allow us to peel these eggs beautifully. Okay, our eggs have been chilling out and it is time to crack them. So what I'll do is I'll take the egg and I will Tap it on a flat surface to break up that shell. And then here's my trusty sidekick. Say hello to the spoon. We wanna make sure that the spoon goes underneath that coating. And the spoon is going to do a gorgeous job of lifting that shell right off. Wow. How satisfying is that? I mean, come on, you guys, take a look at that. Absolutely perfect soft boiled egg. Our rice is nice and frozen and it is time to fry them up. So we're going to start by adding avocado oil to our skillet. We are going to heat this up until it is shimmering and while we're waiting for that to heat up, let's slice up our rice. We're going to take that overhang that we have and delicately lift the rice block out. 
Look at how great that looks. Pull it back. And then what I like to do to make sure that we have even squares is I like to slice off about a half of an inch off of the sides of the rice. And you really wanna make sure that you're using a sharp knife here. Fabulous. Take this, compost it. And then we are going to cut these into nine even pieces, about two inches by two inches. We are going to crisp these up for about five minutes per side until we get a nice golden brown crust on the exterior. Set your timers. These are looking really good and now it is time to flip. Ooh, gorgeous golden. We love to see that. These are looking beautiful. We're gonna transfer them to a wire rack lined baking sheet. And we wanna salt these rice cakes while they are still hot so that they can hold on to the salt that hits them. Okay, I'm going to fry up this next batch and then it will be the moment we're all waiting for, topping the rice cakes and eating them. You can top these any way you like, but I'm gonna show you my favorite way to serve these crispy rice cakes. We'll start with our beautiful avocado. Whenever I'm picking an avocado, I always wanna make sure that when I press down, it has a little bit of give. Another great way to test is I'll look at the top of the avocado where the stem is. If you pull the stem out and you see that the inside is a nice bright green color, that is how you know the avocado is perfectly ripe. So we are going to take a sharp knife we will insert it into the top of the avocado until you hit the pit, and then delicately roll the avocado around, slicing through to cut it in half. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous. As far as peeling the avocado is concerned, instead of scooping it out with a spoon, I love to peel the skin off with my fingers. And then we are going to take the avocado and with the tip of our knife, we will slice into thin strips. I just really love how fancy it looks when you slice it. I think adding a nice, punchy, bright element with a lemon wedge is an awesome way to just give a little extra oomph to your overall presentation. Next up, we have our eggs. This is a really fun trick that I love to use when I am serving these eggs on our crispy rice. You're gonna take your egg. If you want, you can dunk it in a little bit of water or you could even just roll it in that residual lemon just to get it slightly wet. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna take that seasoning and you're going to roll the egg into the Everything Bagel seasoning. I'm a big fan of Everything Bagel seasoning, huge fan. And once this is nicely seasoned, you'll take your sharp knife and slice right through, revealing that perfect jammy yolk. Are you kidding me? I mean, how stunning is that? That is incredibly satisfying. So let's bring back one of our crispy rice pieces. This one has that avocado on it. And for this one, some of our pastrami smoked salmon. I love pastrami smoked salmon, so it's just your traditional smoked salmon, except it has pastrami spice on it. Now I'm gonna plate these up and make them even more gorgeous with our sauce. And what I like to do is just create a really beautiful swoosh on the bottom of the platter and just spread it into a really beautiful layer. Now it is time to adorn our platter with our crispy rice. So remember those green scallion tops that we saved earlier? We are going to take them and just sprinkle them over the tops just for a little extra jewelry and flavor. Okay, I can't contain myself. I have to try one of these. I'm gonna take a little lemon, squeeze it over the top. Let's give it a taste. Okay. 
First of all, do you hear that crunch? That is stunning. I just have to say that this is one reason why you should never toss out your leftover rice. I promise you, you can always put it to good use. When I first went vegan, I thought I'd had to give up chocolate desserts for good, since so many dessert recipes include dairy or eggs. But now, my day isn't complete without something chocolatey and sweet. It didn't take long for me to discover the magic of aquafaba. What is that, you ask? Well, it's the leftover ingredient that's the key to my fluffy chocolate mousse. And it's actually found in a can of chickpeas. But before we get to that, let's start melting some chocolate. So I have my chocolate here over a double boiler, so let's turn on the heat. We want to set this to a slow simmer. And there's all different varieties of vegan chocolate. I'm using mini chips, but they also have chunks, they have big chips, and it also comes in whole bars. I like the mini chips because they melt quickly, they're easy to work with, and I just want to get my mousse done quickly, so why not go the easy route? Our water is at a slow, gentle simmer, so our chocolate is gonna start melting. You wanna make sure to continuously stir it so then that the heat can be distributed throughout the chocolate and it'll melt evenly. Okay, so once all the chips are melted, our next ingredient for our mousse base is some vegan sweetened condensed milk. This is made entirely from coconut and it is so good, it's gonna add a nice creamy base and really thicken up that chocolate and kind of make it a ganache consistency. Now, you can flavor this however you'd like, but I like mine a little bit luxurious and indulgent, so we're gonna give this an amaretto flavor. So it's gonna be a bit of almond, a bit of vanilla. It's gonna taste like Italy. So to this, we're gonna add one ounce of amaretto liquor. Once the liquor is incorporated, we're gonna add in two flavorings, a splash of vanilla and a splash of almond. Almond extract smells so good, but a little goes a long way. It's very strong, so make sure to just add a tiny splash because otherwise it'll become too bitter and overwhelm the whole dish. And it should look like this, glossy and thick almost like the consistency of a ganache. So this looks great, so I'm gonna remove it from the heat and let it cool completely. So while our chocolate cools, we can work on our secret ingredient, our aquafaba. So aquafaba may sound fancy, but all it is 
is the water from a can of chickpeas. Instead of tossing this, which most people do, if you whip aquafaba up, it turns into a consistency almost of an egg white or like a meringue. You can use it in all different ways. The way I would think about aquafaba is the same as egg whites. So if you were to use egg whites in a dish or even whipped cream, you can substitute it with aquafaba. I recommend getting a can of low sodium or no salt added chickpeas. That way the water doesn't affect the flavor of what you're making. So what we wanna do is to our stand mixer fitted with the whip attachment, we want to make sure that our bowl is chilled. So right before I whip up my aquafaba, I like to keep my bowl in the fridge for at least 10 to 15 minutes so it gets ice cold. And the reason why we wanna do that is because it'll then help us whip up the aquafaba so it turns into stiff peaks. If it's too warm, then it's not gonna whip up and it's just gonna fall flat. So lock in your mixer and we're gonna set it to high. So I'm gonna stop the mixer because I wanna add a little bit of cream of tartar. This is gonna help stiffen up the peaks and get us that nice glossy stiff peak that we're looking for in a chocolate mousse. So let's go ahead and add that in and turn on mixer back on high. Let's give it another minute or two to get it real stiff because the stiffer it is, the more delicate and airy our mousse is gonna be. Okay, our aquafaba is looking good. Yep, this is exactly what we want. A stiff peak, it doesn't fall. So now we want to fold our aquafaba into our melted chocolate that's been cooled. We start with a little bit and you gently fold it in. If I just sat here and stirred it, it would turn into a soup and it would not set into a mousse. So we wanna make sure we're adding in as much air as possible. So I keep folding until I don't see any more streaks and then I go in with some more dollops of aquafaba. Okay, this looks beautiful. So we're ready for our next dollop. This is looking great, it's all an even color. So now I just have to get into little jars so it can set in the fridge. So I'm gonna clear up my area so I can do that. So we're gonna pour this in here and set it in the fridge overnight. So our mousse have set overnight and they look beautiful. You can see they're perfectly set. There's no liquid. You can see all of the beautiful air bubbles. It does not look vegan, let me tell you. I'm garnishing these with fresh cherries, but you can easily use a jarred cherry like an amarena, which will go really well with this. Okay, now I think it's fair to say that I have been waiting way too long to actually dig into this. So why don't we go for a taste? 
Can you believe this texture? This is made from chickpea water. No egg whites, no dairy, chickpea water. All right, you ready? Wow, it's so airy, yet so decadent. I hope this inspires you guys to cook low waste and zero waste recipes at home and try this mousse. But for now, I'm gonna keep enjoying and indulging. Mm. Good Thursday morning and we are starting with breaking news. A manhunt ending overnight after a frightening school shooting. It's March 23rd, this is today. Breaking overnight, police find the body of a 17-year-old suspect accused of 